Hello and welcome everyone to the 88th episode of Everyday Eternal. This is going to be a very special episode because, you know, most of the time we talk about legacy, we love legacy, but not only per popular request in our Discord, but also because of all the things happening lately in the greater Eternal community, we are doing a very, very cool vintage-themed episode today. And whom better to invite than whom I want to call Mr. Vintage, Justin Gennari. I am actually level one, who's probably the vintage streamer, content creator out there right now. Is, is, can we say that about you, Justin? Is, is that true? I think, unfortunately, that might be true. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can big it up. You can say, fortunately, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not a bad time. Yeah, yeah. You're just constantly, awesome. constantly streaming and playing vintage, so I think it's fair. Before we get into vintage, Callum, how have you been? How, how are things for you? How's the UK going? Yeah, good man. Um, there's just so many things going wrong with the world. It's hard to keep up with. Uh, I've almost forgotten about Brexit, you know, and now like uh, being glued to the presidential election and COVID and everything. And yeah, it's just like uh, hard to really know what's going on in the UK currently. Um, but otherwise, things are going well. Um, been playing a lot of Legacy much more than I do usually, which is really sweet. I uh, discovered a new deck you might have heard of called Elves. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> you like play these one ones, and the, the deck is like a, more of a sum of its parts. And it, I would call I would classify it as a combo deck, not a mid range deck for sure. So, been playing that a lot, like loving it, loving it, loving it. So, um, yeah, that's what I've been up to. Yeah, dude. Actually, I've been I've been checking out a couple of streams lately, and on every other stream, I saw you casting Quarian Ranger. So mm -hmm. you were playing a lot, actually. Are you playing in the Mana Traders event as well? Yeah. So I played Mana Traders event. Uh, uh, yeah, I played last night. Did it start yesterday? I can't remember. Um, yeah, I played the t the first ten matches and went eight two. So pretty nice. Um, played versus a lot of Delver, and I beat all the Delvers, and then a bunch of graveyard decks, and I lost to a couple of them. But that's what the uh, if you can call a meta game in the mana traders thing feels like a lot of those two kind of archetypes but um yeah I, I i think i even played like five leagues in the day before that i'm just loving playing it so much it's you played five leagues no yeah that's actually quite a lot yeah i really i just played five leagues just like on sunday i just loved playing it because it's new for me like i've played against the decks so much in the past like hundreds of times so i know all the tricks and stuff i know what's going on but i'd actually only played it myself twice just in two leagues randomly so now i'm just like diving in i'm starting to get the uh the play patterns and stuff allosaurus rider makes it feel like it's easy mode so if... shepherd shepherd sorry yeah yeah that one <laughs> <laughs> oh rider we can get into as well like uh get winged to Sar on here but um <laughs> yeah i i'm just it's it's a breath of fresh air for me because i was not sure what deck to play recently and I like some blue control decks and I, like, I kind of enjoy combo currently as well. And so this is like a nice mix of both worlds and stuff. So yeah, Elves are sweet. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I've been trying to get Marcus hooked, you know, Marcus Truckers123. Um, I would like to respond. I think his name is on yeah, yeah. right now. Oakland deck, but it's it's a losing battle. We've actually been playing more Brute War <laughs> than Legacy lately with him, but <laughs> he seems to have a, a crisis about which deck to play. And I keep trying yeah. to sell him on Elves. And now that you're on Elves, you know, one day I, I shall see him cast Natural Order. But that's the thing. It's You draw lots of cards, but I think he enjoys the Elvish Visionary side, but the Glimpse of Nature side is too easy. You need to work for the card draws. <laughs> like, it's part of the blue machine. You, and you want selection as well. It's not just about drawing cards. You and... have to tell him it's the green high tide, right? That'll work? Yeah. Ooh, that would be like a cycle, right? <laughs> Can we play Hunting Pack and Cordon Crossroads in uh, Elves? That's actually what it, that, that's literally what I did 20 years ago. Really? At school. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's so bad. Justin, do you ever get to play a lot of, uh, or at least some Legacy, or is, is, uh, are you primarily committed to Vintage? I don't get to play as much legacy as I used to. I played it a little bit back when I was uh, like trying to like grind the, the GP circuit. So there was usually um, a Star City Games legacy in uh, Massachusetts, and sometimes there'd be a GP around. I played in GP Seattle during Deathrite Shaman Grixis Delver era, um, and I, I just played that deck blind, and I, I almost... I was 11 and 0 to start, or 10 and 0 to start, and Damn. then all the wheels fell off when I faced all the good legacy players. <laughs> <laughs> I looked oh, to my right, and it was like Noah Walker, and then it was like um, uh, Dilks on on uh, on lands, and I just like, oh, I'm I'm very outclassed here. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is like one of those memes. Um, it's round ten. They still haven't discovered. I don't know anything. What I'm uh, what I'm doing. <laughs> you probably knew more about what you were doing than you would be admitting here. 
but uh, yeah, I, I, I primarily associate you with vintage, I guess, but it's cool to hear that you also went like pretty deep into legacy for a while. What, what has your journey actually been? When, when did you start playing Magic and how, how did you actually end up being, yeah, like we called you, the, the top tier vintage content creator <laughs> right now who probably got a lot of people into the format? Yeah, at the beginning, it was like a lot like uh, other kids in the States. I learned to play Magic at Boy Scout camp. I saw two older, uh, you know, older guys playing. Uh, it was Tooth and Nail versus Affinity, something like that. And I was just hooked on that. So I, uh, you know, bought decks, played with my brother for a while, played with my friends. And then eventually it died off, picked it back up in high school. Um, and then just started to try to get into like the, the local gaming store scene, start playing you know, more competitive matches. I actually had the same local gaming store as Melissa DeTora. So I would just, I would go there and get crushed and then come back and get crushed. <laughs> <laughs> Probably lost like 90% of my matches, but that really like sparked some like competitive drive. So in college, in the in the gaming club at the University of Rhode Island, we played a lot in there. And then we started to go to tournaments, started to go to tournaments. Um, eventually, uh, I can't remember, it was coming back from, uh, Grand Prix Montreal, which was probably a limited tournament back then, and I was talking to my buddy Dan Nelson, and we were they were talking about uh, I don't know if you know Cerebral Assassin, the card, or is that a nickname? Of no, no, it's not a card. It's a it's a classic vintage deck from sometime in the two th- early two thousands. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I didn't know this. <laughs> and so this deck used um, Bazaar of Baghdad, and it would. Um, it would use like animate dead to bring back world order dragon and stuff like that. And so well, we I... were just, <laughs> we were just talking about, it wasn't world order, like it boarded into world order dragon. Oh, um, okay, okay. It, so it, it, I'm trying to remember which the deck they, they sold me on it. Cause it had squeeze and it was doing like uh tinker things. And so we decided we wanted to play that at one of the biggest vintage tournaments in the, in the States, uh, the manager and open TMD, uh, sometimes called the Waterbury open. And so that was actually my first vintage tournament. We went to the Waterbury, had a bunch of beers, and we played Cerebral Assassin. So I was playing, um, do you know, Possess Portal? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the one yeah, that so... has that activated ability, right? <laughs> what, what is it? Eight, an Plays eight control mana cards, artifact. And it's, it's bullshit, but it's great. Eight mana artifact. No one's drawing any more cards. At every end step on you know, each turn, uh, they have some, each play or it's either that player or each player has to discard or sacrifice a permanent. So you're you're welding you're using goblin welder and oh my you're God. and you're welding possess portals into play and then because you have squeeze that you're pitching with your bazaar <laughs> uh you are not as locked as your pony is <laughs> and so eventually they have to sack their whole hand and their whole board and you have some squeeze or something and you attack and you kill them <laughs> <laughs> I and love you're telling me that was like honestly that sounds like the craziest apparently competitive eternal deck i've ever heard about it plays process oh. portal Bazaar, Squee, it has Tinker in it, and it boards into Dragon, and that's a it, thing? It was, it was maybe a thing like, oh, now, like 16 years ago. By the time I played it, this was only, I don't know, four or five years ago? Maybe not even. It wasn't a thing. We were just like, it's time to Dak it. It's time. Let's update this. And what we found out was every card that was printed in the last 10 years completely invalidated the deck in every way. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a great tournament so so much fun that we did it another year <laughs> we did it two years in a row uh and after that i was like wait a second vintage is actually really fun what if we actually tried to get competitive playing this format and so then i started playing paradoxical outcome i got really good at playing paradoxical outcome uh ended mm-hmm. up winning the tmd the next year and that kind of uh springboarded me into playing magic online and, and streaming and that kind of thing Oh, that's that, that's amazing. These days, um, vintage is basically all you do, right? But but, but didn't you qualify for for the? I, I want to say the pro tour. I literally don't even know what's it called these days. Basically, one <laughs> of the the premier level of play events through playing vintage. You might actually yeah. be the very first one to do that. I, I think I'm the second. I believe I'm the second, at least through like Cannot modern the day wrong guy. Mod, Shit. modern day vintage. <laughs> so Mox 2019 or this one will be Mox 2019. Mox yeah, 2019 is about one? to happen. And I believe one of the players uh, qualified through that through Vintage because I, I didn't make that um, that final level of the premiere last year. I, I like, failed all my qualifiers. Uh, but this year in Season 2, Vintage replaced Popper at the premiere level at MTGO. Uh, and I was lucky enough to 
win a uh, top eight a showcase challenge and then i won the showcase qualifier which qualified me for not only the mox but the zendikar rising split championship which should be in december i believe <laughs> is the name, name of that tournament <laughs> from what that sounds from what like people a very prestigious me, tournament that is supposed to be a pro tour equivalent <laughs> that's what i've been told anyways the most important thing is is, is it going to give you like a t-shirt that you can wear to your local lts or something I'm just hoping they give me an arena account, to be perfectly honest, because I still don't have one of those. <laughs> but all, all jokes oh, aside, that is that is really cool that you like did it with what you love and with vintage. Like I don't know, if you told me even like, just a few years ago you you were going to qualify for the Pro Tour playing vintage, I wouldn't believe that. Like uh, it sweet. took me so long to wrap my head around that, and it was just like, well, whoa, whoa, did I really like? I, I grind. I went to all these GPs. I ground out all these local PTQs in New England, which are some of the hardest <laughs> Magic tournaments I think anywhere. Um, I, I, I flew to, I played in GP Stockholm. I played in GPs in, in Italy. I, I, I tried really yeah. hard to qualify for the pro tour, like the normal way. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> after all the GPs go away, there's no more GPs. <laughs> suddenly boom, pro tour qualification playing vintage. I, it was, it could kind of blew Amazing. my mind. And you beat, oh, you beat Reed in the finals, right? Reed yeah. Duke. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to top it off. Like. That 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 tw- it was a twenty two players tournament and that was a stacked tournament. Yeah, Everyone in there was shit. extremely good. Yeah, I was looking I was looking for the list because even if I'm not qualified for these events, I love trying to follow them and watching along for every format. And I was I think vintage was probably the most stacked out of the ones that I remember off the top of my oh, head. It was that, that's actually insane. really amazing. Yeah, especially if like if you consider that Reed actually got a st- like big break as a player when he qualified for the mocks. I think that, I want to was- say like. 15 years ago or something yeah that's how he became famous totally yeah all i know is i'm gonna be the huge underdog come that uh that mox it's eight players and the other the other seven players are way better at magic than i am bunch of bunch of sickos we play so much and they're so good i'm really excited though it should be a lot of fun yeah Dude, I, I remember when it used to be like at the pro tour where, where your name tag that you were wearing also said like how you qualified so it's like i don't know pro points pro tour top eight platinum or something i, I wish we still had that and yours would just say the vintage champion and people would be like, huh, huh, I have no idea what I'm in for. And then you uh, <laughs> then you pick up the craziest deck in the world. Uh, we, we, but towards the end, we're actually going to have another question from our friend Tom DeDecker about your preparation for, for the Pro Tour. Maybe you can already tell us that we're going to skip that because you have no idea. But <laughs> I, 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 I will be rooting for you for sure. I, I'm going to I'm going to try like uh, it's my first Pro Tour. I really want to do well, but I I. I'm not going to lie and say I'm going to try my hardest, I think. Um, I, like I said, I still don't have an arena account. Um, Magic Online <laughs> did say they're going to, or Magic Wizard said they were going to provide uh, full, full, full stocked accounts for that tournament. Um, but the, So I, I'm going to only have a couple of weeks of testing. And I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to do my best. Uh, but I don't have high hopes. <laughs> so I guess we're already answering the question then. Um, so you were going to say you, you, you're not going to try your best, which I, I, I love. That's actually the best way to... To go about it, um, I've you've, you've basically been telling us you've been trying to qualify for this thing for half your life as a competitive <laughs> player, and now that you've made it, you're like, yeah, you know what, whatever. <laughs> well, it's it's gonna be a, a, a standard event. I don't think it's gonna be draft because I think they've done away with drafts at the Pro Tour. Um, but I, I haven't played a match of standard in, I, God, I don't even know the last time I played a match of standard. Uh, they've changed the format so much in the past couple of years with you know the recent printings. So um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in. I'm gonna you know. I'm going to reach out to some people who are who are much better than me and try to make sure I have myself on the best deck. But like I said, it's not going to be it's not going to be the level of practice if I had qualified for a paper pro tour during my GP grinding days. I, I, I imagine if I had done it done it then, I would be playing every night, you know, six hours, seven hours until I go to bed. This is going to be probably a lot less than that, especially like with a real job now compared to you know a lot of those GPs that I played in were the end of college days or the start of my uh, start of my career days. So. Okay, okay. So these days you already mentioned you're not that uh, dedicated to actually grinding. Well, I guess we don't have paper tournaments anymore anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but you, you do a lot of streaming. Um, where, where can actually people find your stream, first of all? Yeah, so I'm on Twitch TV. I'm actually level one. That's spelled with LVL1 at the end. Um, also on YouTube under the same name. Basically, I stream anytime I'm playing Magic Online. O- almost anytime. Like probably 90% of my Magic Online matches I'll stream because... The whole reason I started it was like, this is going to be more fun if there's some kind of social aspect instead of me just sitting here on my computer at night just playing playing matches of vintage. And I really did like grow to enjoy it 
a lot. And that whole aspect of, oh, I'm playing vintage, but I'm playing vintage together with my friends. I thought that was a lot more appealing to me than, oh, I'm playing in this Magic Online daily by myself and, and having a beer and just and, and chilling. So it's it's kind of funny how vintage, you know, like grinding vintage in a way is a little bit like drinking. All of a sudden it becomes socially acceptable if you do it like in a in a social setting as opposed to sitting there like <laughs> at 2 a.m. in the morning casting Tinker and hoping it resolves. Like if somebody's watching you, then it's totally okay. <laughs> I mean, I've done that too, but <laughs> uh, I just think it's, I think magic is more fun when, when you're communicating with other people and, and discussing it. And I, I just like that a lot more than uh, just sitting by myself and playing magic online, so... Yeah, totally. I, I'm definitely seeing where you come from with that. We have another question with regards to that um, from Tom Decker. Justin's dream grew to be one of the most popular series of vintage content out there today. What were his goals when he started and what are his ambitions at this point? So is, is that like what you wanted to do? Did you want to get more people into vintage because you certainly succeeded at that? Uh, I was just looking back at it because I started streaming a lot August of August of 2018. And I, I assume that's it, it's either right before or probably right after I won the TMD. Um, and I, I think I did use that as a as a springboard. I mean, I wrote, I wrote an article for Star City Games, something like uh, building the perfect paradoxical outcome, uh, just like a guide on how to use your flex slots in PO. It was for their Star, uh, Star City Power 9 series that they were trying to um, return to at SCG Con. Uh, and, and I basically did use that as a way to start getting people in. I had always planned on on doing some amount of streaming. I actually had planned to be streaming League of Legends when I was playing that in college. I had, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had uh, I started the league club at my local university. I played uh, collegiately with a, with a group of friends. It was a ton of fun. I always thought I would stream that or even commentate that. Those were some of my goals, but. I decided to go all in on uh, finishing my degree and getting an engineering job, which was probably the correct choice. But sometimes, you know, leaves me with a little regrets. But <laughs> thank you for the vintage I could have played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so now now I still do the engineering, but when I come home, I I, I just stream whatever game I'm playing normally. Um, it really wasn't to bring anyone in. It was really just to make. I thought it would just be more enjoyable experience personally. And then people, you know, people started joining, people started started liking the stream and it became even more fun when there was, you know, a, a crew that would show up and we, we would play vintage and we would, we would laugh at me getting mind break trapped. Um, <laughs> it just, <laughs> it became more of a, more of a community thing than anything. And then once I realized like, oh, this is like starting to pick up steam. Now there's, you know, there's a lot less vintage streamers. I'm one of the, you know, the few that are still doing it. I'm like, well, now I want to make sure that we, I can keep doing this. I want to make sure more people are playing vintage. I need to make sure there, you know, there are more than 100 people in queue so the queue times aren't 20 minutes or because there's been times like that. Yeah, I've, I've seen it go to like 40 or 50 minutes at, at, at times when, when Rich Shea was uh, streaming, who's, by the, by the way, coming back to streaming. So you you get some competition for that. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think you've been hovering between like 100 and 200 for years lately. That's amazing, especially for, for like a niche format like vintage, right? It's, it's, it's actually really crazy because I... It wasn't like that until until recently. It was been, it's been a big boom. You know, a lot of things COVID did wrong. One thing it did well for me was keep a lot of people home and have them watch watch <laughs> my content. Got to find some silver lining somewhere. <laughs> um, but really, during the the series of like initial lockdowns, um, I, I streamed a ton. I streamed a ton. During, I streamed almost every day during that period, and, and there were tons of people just looking looking for something to do. Um, tons of people who would normally have jobs or who, who were laid off or, or on furlough who were, who just really wanted to see see some vintage being played. So um, the numbers really shot up during that time, and they've been pretty steady, and I've been really happy trying to make sure that uh, everyone gets to see some vintage. Yeah, whenever I was like went on to find something to watch, I watched you loads, and but not always chatting. And you were just always online, and it was so nice to be. I was like, oh, I'm going to log on to Twitch, and Justin's probably playing. So it's... Mm -hmm. uh, it was nice and reliable. <laughs> yeah, one of the, one of the things about streaming is you're you're definitely incredibly rewarded for consistency. The one, the thing that new streamers need to to do is always be on at the same time every every day or every week or or whatever their time is. And so for me, it was really just if I had the energy, I come home from work and I, I would just stream as much as I could. I would stream like a league or two leagues. In the beginning, it was it was more like two leagues. Now now I'm lucky to get one done, but um. And, and then, especially with the paper tournaments leaving 
you know, because well, no one can attend them because they don't exist. <laughs> um, I was free to do the vintage challenge every weekend. And the vintage challenge was incredibly helpful because I- I've noticed that Twitch viewers want to see Premiere play above everything else. They will always tune in, no matter what the format is, if there are stakes and it's high level magic, that's what they want to see. And so during challenges, my numbers go crazy high. And then if I'm winning during the challenge, it, you know, that just that's a snowball of momentum. Sometimes during like these top eights of these challenges or something, like 200, 300 viewers, and sometimes that's without even someone rating. But a lot of the times, if a vintage stream, you know, they, they don't make top eight, they'll send people to send their viewers to someone who's still playing. And it really helped that for a while I was t- I was top hitting a lot of vintage challenges. <laughs> Dude, I, it helps I, I like when you win, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the way it works is like you beat somebody and then you get to basically consume their stream and you yep. absorb their viewers. <laughs> so by by the very end, isn't that like a game, this, this Japanese game, We Love Katamari or something, where you're this ball <laughs> that rolls around, everything sticks to it. And by the very end, you become bigger than the planet you were on and then the pl- planet sticks to you or something. I, I feel that that's yeah, probably that place it's Kind of, yeah. It was great for a while because... <laughs> While there aren't very many, you know, consistent weekly big vintage streamers, during the vintage challenge, there are a large number of streamers. One thing I really like to do with the help of uh, of Rafa, who logged T1 if you've ever been in my chat, he likes to put together, um, you ever use multi-twitch? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so he'll grab a multi-twitch of every single streamer who's streaming vintage. Sometimes that's, that's you know, eight or nine streamers. And they'll start getting whittled down, and it'll all it'll all come into someone out of the nine streamers is going to top eight. So it gets to I keep going. Turning that wheel, <laughs> just consuming everything. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was great. Yeah, I love the vintage challenges. Actually, have the the highest penetration of streamers. It's I, I don't know because I don't I don't go look at the other challenges that much because I I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> I, I think consumed, it might be honestly. Consumed. I I did a modern. There's maybe a little bit more. I do I do tune into people who play modern stuff. Legacy is very consistent with some amazing ones, but there's not that many. Like Anorag will always play, Chase, Strifo will always play. But then mm-hmm. I'm gonna feel bad because I'm missing some people out that play every single one, stream every single one. But um after the like, the consistent ones it does drop off pretty fast and you have people doing random ones. But if you have eight people always streaming vintage ones, then that's that's really high. That content, so. shout out to Testacular, who's been streaming a lot of AFS challenges lately. And I think mm-hmm. he top eighted like almost every single one that he streamed lately. It's yeah, actually wow. kind, of, kind of funny. He's insane with elves. It's ridiculous. That's great. Yeah, you have I something like to I, look I, up to, I... Julian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys are coming for me, I know. <laughs> I feel like so... I, I skipped Tom's second half of that point, which is where, where are we going? And that's a great question because I wish I knew. Uh, I, I like <laughs> the fact that we're bringing in people right now. Um, it, it really does feel like the online vintage community is growing. The word is getting out that it's cheap. If you're using rental services for modern already, that covers your vintage deck. Modern decks can be way more expensive than vintage decks on Magic Online. Um, and, and if you really think about it, a lot of the times people really want to cast Black Lotus. They really want to activate their bazaars and their Mishra's workshops. They just... They aren't given the opportunity to, and I, and I think Magic Online gives a really accessible opportunity in terms of at least Magic Online. Uh, I wouldn't say in terms of like all kinds of games, but in terms of Magic Online, it gives you a great opportunity for almost anyone to try. A thing that I really noticed recently is there's a ton of teenage vintage players right now on Magic Online. And their mums. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're doing extremely well, and it's just because yeah. they've been given the chance. Like, none of these players are ever going to get to probably hold a Black Lotus or get to play in an internal weekend in paper, but uh, Magic Online doesn't restrict them from doing that, which I think is kind of amazing. I love that they're embracing it as well, because there's always been this kind of pushback just to the word vintage, because it comes with the association of, like, how much it costs. It's just, you, you just can't get into vintage in paper if you're young or whatever. It's just completely out the roof. So, you have um, to be old. It's <laughs> yeah, like it's a requirement. They don't sell you the Lotus you, unless you have, you're You old. have to have a crazy job with yeah. crazy income or you have to have had the cards already. Like It's just really... I mean, you can grind, get pieces here and there and stuff, but it's it's super tough and the reward is very often, I think, not really worth it if you're building from the very bottom up with nothing. But as Justin said, being able to play online, it's not expensive and these rental accounts let you play everything. So yeah, I love that the younger younger generation are just jumping straight into vintage and as you said they're really good um they're good at legacy as well we had uh one more combo win one of the legacy playoffs um he's one of the ones i think you mean when you say they're playing vintage as well right 
Yeah, I'm thinking like uh, Wombo and Jacob and Raided exactly. and and all in that crew. Exactly. So yeah, more power to them. Love it. Awesome. So something that you are also very well known for is that you usually post a breakdown of what's going on in vintage right i i don't know if it has like an actual name that that the vintage files or anything you, you probably got to come up with something like that maybe you already have that and <laughs> maybe I before get a we me- <laughs> yeah d- definitely before we mention how many matches you actually have in the database uh, i want our audience like take a short second to guess and be before we do that um for how long have you been recording your last data set i guess that might have been since the last ban uh, or rather yeah, it actually might have been a, lot, a ban, right? Pretty unique in, in terms of vintage that a card gets banned. In, in this case, Lurus. Yeah, I can't. I can't take all the credit because I, I am picking up on uh, something that was going on before me. So from from what I know about it, uh, Matt Murray, Shelby Rain, uh, one of the bigger vintage streamers, uh, and Ryan Eberhardt, uh, Dio fan, were doing this data collection previous to me, but with Matt's somewhat waning interest in vintage recently uh i i picked it back up so they've been they were collecting data uh long before i even started and the data sets we like to look at are pretty much start and it bannings or large metagame shifts so one of the data sets previously to when i started doing uh recording was the karn forge uh, meta game where where there was Narset was unrestricted, uh, Karn was unrestricted, Mystic Forge was unrestricted, um, and then of course those cards got restricted and, and the meta game changed very drastically. So when you, when you start adding you know or, or separating those data sets, you can get a little clearer picture on what's going on. So then after that there was the Luris meta game, which was you know obviously completely different from the one before that. The data set we're looking at these days is the post Luris ban data set, which is you know starting in in july of this year and since july we've recorded around eighteen thousand matches of vintage <laughs> dude that really blows my mind Eighteen thousand yeah. matches i mean people always talk about hey I, I i've got a data set of 100 matches so here's my win percentage in this and that match i'm like okay yeah that's that's nice you played four matches against this matchup okay so tell me about your 75 percent matchup cool but you got eighteen thousand matches in your data it's- it's even better than eight, 18,000 matches because this doesn't include any league matches. This is 18,000 premier level events. This is challenges, showcases, uh, showcase qualifiers, NYSE, PAX, uh, Eternal Weekend, those kind of events. And to clarify, this is not like something you get from, uh, well, I guess, hacking Magic Online or something. You you literally have a squad of people who are watching all the replays of the challenges, which are accessible after the challenge has completed, right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, when you're in a tournament on Magic Online, uh, you're not allowed to watch the replays during the tournament. But as the tournament concludes, those replays become available to anyone who is in the tournament. Now, if you close your tournament, you you will lose access to those replays. But what we do is for people who are in the challenge or the event, we have a a group of people who are willing to stay after the tournament concludes and, and watch replays and categorize decks and data. Uh, and we put them into the same spreadsheet every week. And then at the end, we'll, we'll combine all the spreadsheets to look at, at the full the full data count. That's actually insane. You, and you also did that for all the almost all the tournaments in Eternal Week and Vintage, right? I think you did it for the first right. and the third one, which you described to me quite vividly as, as having like a, a team of five people or something. And as you were working through the night, Magic Online was, was memory leaking really hard and one after another, like you lost this guy, you lost that guy. And eventually it was just like <laughs> you standing. It literally sounded like the Vietnam War that you were fighting there. It was crazy. Well, the first thing that came to my head is just like um, Star Wars, like going into the uh, Death Star and you're like being protected <laughs> by your people around you. And you're like, you're getting there. I'm almost there. I'm almost at the end. And uh yeah. Oh, you're doing the trench run. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was know. a completely surreal experience because <laughs> for these challenges, we have the luxury, or or maybe it's a not a or it's a luxury for the for re, the replayers, anyways. That there there are fifty to seventy players typically, uh, which means you're, you're you're only watching, I don't know, 40, 40, you know, forty matches to determine all the decks. When we got to Eternal Weekend three, which was the second largest vintage event of all time obviously the largest magic online vintage event of all time and we're, we're, we're approaching 500 players that's that's a crazy amount of replays and so even though we were very lucky and we had maybe four 
or five people doing replays, uh, it, it just took so long that you know, when you have a, a 500 re- uh, player tournament, so it's a lot of it's a lot of data there, and you're activating your replays over and over again. Magic Online not exactly built for that. And so as you're replaying these matches over and over again, you're starting to get you know, more and more memory leaking, more and more crashing. And so you would just, every so often, someone would be like, ah, I can't do it anymore, guys. Like, it's just, it's locked up. It lagged out. My computer overheated. And I'm sitting here with my... <laughs> computer overheated. We're talking about magic online. I, I, yeah. dude, I'm just loving it. <laughs> we're talking about the, the, we're talking about overheating computers, CPU usage that's just way, CPU and memory usage that's just way above what a computer should be doing. <laughs> and I'm sitting here with my, my stupid League of Legends gaming rig that I built a couple years ago that has way more memory than ever needed. And, 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 the, and, the, and rated uh, one of the teenagers we were talking about before, he's like, guys, uh, I can't do it anymore. It's using up 90% of my memory. It's like two gigs or something, there, <laughs> three gigs. And I'm over here like, yeah, I am, I'm, I'm using up 10 gigs of memory right Jesus. now for Magic Online. <laughs> oh my god but but we got through we got through all the data for for eternal weekends one and three unfortunately we couldn't do eternal weekend two the mo- the majority of our players who do um data are, are from the states so eternal weekend two ended at some ungodly hour for the states so no one was really in, yeah. in the right state of mind to do it for that one that's reasonable but i'm really lucky that i have um Aylet. tuesday is noob uh, yeah mark will, yes yeah. he will do the data collection for me or for us i should say uh, for the 3 a.m. 3 a.m. my time Sunday yeah, yeah. challenge, that's uh, cool. That that the addition of the Sunday Venture challenge I think was really really great for for Magic Online. It gave the European players and the Japanese players who have both have very big vintage communities uh, a, a, a better option than <laughs> staying up to the to yeah. the wee hours in the morning. Because yeah, vintage is always starting a couple of hours later than the legacy ones. Because I'm usually playing the legacy ones and starts at. 4 p.m but when it starts at 6 then if you do well it really does go into like 12 1 o'clock and it's just a bit too much on a sunday or whatever yeah but yeah extra shout out to mark who he does listen to this podcast so um i've met him many times and played against him a bunch in england really really great guy been playing vintage for a long long time and he's been messaging me for like the last at least six months saying callum vintage is really really fun you should play it more <laughs> and he's right i should play it more and it is fun Dude, I, I, I can definitely confirm <laughs> that. I've Just like from my background, my first vintage tournament was, was in 2009. And I I think I went like 0 and 6 or something, 0 and 7. I played Oath and I somehow figured Hellkite Overlord was the best thing to get. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <in Oath. laughs> nice. Yeah, that didn't work out. That really didn't work out very well. And then I've. I've been on and off playing it sporadically. I've been I've played it at Bazaar of Moxens, and I think I got like a top sixteen or two at Bazaar of Moxen, but I, I never really felt like it was what I was doing. But overall, I think it might actually be my winningest format of all times, like just win percentage wise. Yeah. And now I came came basically back into it for for this tournament, and I gotta say, like those matches I played in preparation for the tournament, the Eternal Weekend itself, and like I also played a challenge afterwards. I had so much fun and. I mean, there's always the stereotype about Vintage. It's like, oh, you die on turn one, you die on turn one. Uh, I mean, people say that about Legacy and people say that even more about Vintage. But honestly, like, we don't even need to say anything about that. Just, like, watch the coverage uh, that that we put on magic.gg for et- uh, Eternal Weekend that should come out hopefully this week. Um, we submitted everything to Wizards, so it's up to them now. And those were some insane matches. Like, it, Legacy was great, but I want to say, on average, the vintage matches were even more insane, with one exception. <laughs> we had one match that was really dumb. But especially you, you had some insane matches. You, you had, like, a lot of matches that actually went to time, but basically, like, with both, both players sitting, like, at one or two minutes. And we've seen that time and again, and people can understand you play, like, what's supposed to be... Well, it's not supposed to be a combo deck. It is a combo deck. So people would be like, oh, a vintage combo deck? How long can it, uh, the, the games really go? But apparently so far that you kill your opponent on turn 26 or something, like something totally crazy. And yeah, vintage f- to me as an outsider coming into it and getting a glimpse of it feels like it's in a great spot. Um, why don't we actually explore that spot uh, going through the data? We are also going to post it on, on the website. Uh, but... Just to paint a bigger picture of what Vintage looks like right now, just going by metagame percentages. We have sub-archetypes and we have greater archetypes. So, for example, we have shops as, a, as a, an archetype, 
but those Mishas Workshop decks, they can, for example, either be Ravager decks that are more aggressive, they can also be more Godos decks, which play more like a long game. But for the overall picture of it, the most played archetype seems to be Combo at 24%. Then we have the Xerox decks, which at 18%, which are basically like the the creature... How, how would you call that? They have, I they're, guess the idea behind the name... Traditional blue decks. Yeah, yeah, I guess that, that's a good way to put it. Then we have the Bazaar, the Bazaar of Baghdad decks at 15%. Uh, we have Shop stacks at 13%. Oh, I guess we also have the, the Death Heart Chamber decks at 15%. I guess Death Heart Chamber decks, something like that, would be like the Bug decks, right? Yeah. The, the Xerox decks and the Death Heart Shaman decks can sometimes bleed together, but I, I do think that, in general, the Death Heart Shaman decks play a bit more of a mid-ranging and Planeswalker-focused game plan, where the Xerox decks play a bit more of a spell-focused game plan. And, and I think it does a, a service to separate them inside of the data. Okay, okay. So if, if we were to combine them, they would be sitting at 33%, which is actually quite a lot, um, considering they have a similarish playstyle. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, it, it, it gets a little difficult because I don't... You could argue that they have a similar playstyle, but I, I don't feel that they do. And even inside of the Xerox category, there's a, a very large difference in playstyles. Uh, sometimes you're playing a Rug Planeswalker deck, which is I would consider a Xerox deck, and sometimes you're playing a... Uh, four color breach combo deck, which is also kind of a Xerox deck. The term Xerox gets got a, it's a little blended in recent history. It's a kind of a I like to say paper boomer term <laughs> <laughs> uh, for for old school decks that used to trim on lands uh, by playing more cantrips, basically. And, and so a lot of the Xerox decks are decks that I that play four preordain is, is how I look at it. Um, they play the max number of playable cantrips to to lower their land count and um, and execute more of a spell based game plan. It, it's something that's just like to me they are trying to play all the broken stuff stuff without being a combo deck actually. Right. So so yeah, basically they they are trying to play all the broken blue cards and and, and play more of a, contr- a controlling game. Even the combo versions of those decks like the breach decks they're they're actually more of a control deck with a combo finish uh, like a splinter twin and modern kind of deck yeah yeah that i i guess that's a that does, i think that's what anorak has been playing lately kind of but overall um this looks pretty good uh especially once we take a look at the win percentages right i was about to jump onto that like oh my god this looks so healthy it's incredible I'll let you take it away and say it, but I've just been staring at it like, wow, this looks so good. Yeah, Go especially considering it's it's a data set of 18,000 matches. Yeah. So we have basically everything hovering between 48 and 52%, which is insane. I mean, there's some drop-off for like really bad decks, apparently, like Other. <laughs> Other is only winning 38% <laughs> of their matches. That's probably like... I guess budget decks are. It's it's just any deck that doesn't fall into a traditional category. You know you don't want your brews to to take to paint a different picture for your for your for your tiered archetypes. Yeah, but for for the top tiered archetypes, which are basically shops, bazaar, Xerox, combo, uh, death by chairman, and well, it, it's kind of sad that we can't count oath as a top tier or, or like a most played archetype anymore. It's barely sitting at four percent, but it's it also got basically fifty percent of of a win percentage. So. I'm I'm really impressed and I guess that's part of why I feel so good about the vintage gameplay right now when, when I jumped back into it. It felt like it, it always made for really great matches except for, you know, I guess we gotta talk about the Bazaar decks a little bit because they split off into a couple of different decks by now. Um, back when I started, there was Stretch and that was almost it. There was another deck that tried, you know, but squeeze. I guess we had Uber Mask decks and stuff like that in the past, but mm-hmm. that, that's all gone, right? By now, Bazaar basically means Stretch. And then we got the Hogak Wine decks and the Hollow Wine decks. And then there's the deck that we actually talked about, which we don't even know what's it called because it plays Hollow <laughs> One, but it doesn't play Wrench Wine, but it plays Hogak. So this is like my new favorite deck. I love it. It's so, if you just look at the deck in paper, whatever, it's absolutely hideous. It's ugly. It's completely not what Garfield intended. And it all comes together. And it's just like a Delver deck, like in Legacy. You play some <laughs> threats early and then you counter stuff and you play some removal, except everything's free. So your threats are Basking Root Waller and Hollow One, and then you're getting value with Squeeze and stuff you're discarding. And Kravakian Horror, is that what it's called? I think so. Kravakian Horror, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then your removal is Force of Vigor and Sickening Shoal, and you have Force of, Vig- uh, Force of Will and Force of Negation to just pitch counter everything else. It just looked like, I mean, 
one of the top eight lists had the Ur Dragon in just because it's all five <laughs> colors. I mean, it's just beautiful. I love it. I, I, yeah. I think it's a it. it's a fun exercise in uh in deck history. And now I'm not the biggest vintage deck historian. I haven't been playing for a long time compared to a lot of the other players in the format. Um, but I I saw this whole one happen out, so I can I can explain this one mm. because there were two bizarre archetypes. There was Dredge and there was Survival of the Fittest. Um, and oh, yeah. I actually forgot what, about that. Yeah. Yeah. But what basically happened was between Hollow One and then the printing of Force of Vigor. Um, Force of Vigor allowed these bizarre decks to 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 really accelerate and hone in on their Hollow One game plans. And Survival just kind of became a little outdated. And the Survival deck became the Hollow Vine deck at first. It was um, a player called Han Chobi, as long, along with uh, Andy Markiton, and, and a couple other Magic Online players who were brewing these um, Hollow One-based Bizarre decks. And these decks, in the beginning, started to use uh, Squee, which we talked about from you know Cerebral Assassin days, um, to basically <laughs> offset the downside of Bazaar where you are discarding more cards than you are drawing. If you're discarding Squeeze and getting them back, you're starting to turn your Bazaar into a Faithless Looting and then into card advantage. Um, and, and so these Hollow Vine decks came apart. And then those decks kind of dominated the format slightly for a little while until people were like, whoa, we have to really respect this. And they started playing these Tabernacles and Surgicals and all these cards in the sideboard directly for that deck instead of for Dredge. And then it splintered off a little bit into these more creature-based decks, these Hogak Vine decks, which play... Uh, they're actually a little... They're pretty similar to Hogak in Legacy, from what I know, where you have the mana to actually play. You, you could hard cast the Blood Gas. You could play your Stitcher Supplier and your and use it to play your, your Hogak. And, and those decks weren't as bizarre-reliant. They could actually function a, a, as like a black-green aggro deck, almost. Uh, and, and using Force of Vigor as a way to, to slow down other combo decks, they were able to kind of play that aggro plan it's it really just blows my mind because that's actually the first deck that i tried going back into vintage the you know the really degenerate one that's that feels like i've never played Yu Gi Oh, but everybody tells me that's basically what Yu Gi Oh is playing like you <laughs> like you can cast the audio spells but you never pay mana for it it's just like whatever and it's i, I don't know man the madness behind the deck building of that deck. Um, Callum mentioned this, the, the. This is the, the one that I mentioned. Just a second. The Ur Dragon, yeah. 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 I've, mm. I've had discussions about like whether people should play the Ur Dragon or what's the other called? Scarecrow. Gar- Ab- uh, Abomin- Abomination. That's the Abomination thing. Something. Yeah, which has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess you can morph it off a guy's cradle or whatever. And I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I heard that's like a vintage <laughs> thing. It's. it's. I, I think Wing Tissar cast um, the Scarecrow King, whatever it's called, for nine mana of <laughs> the Bizarre. King. Of the Reaper King, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it was, it's, um, it's really interesting that I mean, Wing Desire is a very good pilot for uh, that kind of archetype. Um, uh-huh. But that deck is, uh, I think we're calling it Horror One. Uh, it's really nice. an experimental deck. It's not even close to fully iterated on. I think the current ones are, you know, forgoing things like the Reaper King and Ur Dragon, and instead they play Prize Amalgams and they and they switch to having like more Noxious Revivals or other things to, f- to facilitate the green count. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So like that deck, that deck is not done yet. You know, some some of these yeah, decks yeah. in vintage are are iterating down to their last you know one or two cards, and, and there's not too much room to improve them. But decks like that are they still have plenty of room to grow. Oops, that's so we, we're gonna link those in the show notes. We're gonna link like all of the the results that we've seen from Eternal Weekend. So if you've never seen this horror one deck, it's the jury is still out between a work of art or an abomination and i guess sometimes <laughs> it can be either both but, definitely both yeah yeah if you had like imagine if you had showed richard garfield like over 25 years ago you you showed him hey this is what magic might look like by the year 2020 <laughs> <laughs> it's like what the fuck is going on <laughs> oh i love that so you yeah you can these... make some really bad looking decks with bazaar of baghdad i, I personally <laughs> experienced that one i think <laughs> i i want i want to see your worst after this. My worst bizarre bag deck. Yeah. Did you see the one I won the challenge with? The uh, Riddle Smith. Oh my god! <laughs> Opal yes, Chase I did. Daredevil. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. You win. <laughs> Dude, one day, one day I want to see Ubermask come back. There, there used to be a deck in Vintage when I got into it that basically played Workshop, all the Blue Power, Bazaar of Baghdad, and Ubermask to basically <laughs> ultra abuse anything broken. That that was maybe one of the most broken decks that still kind of played fair. 
for vintage standards. I'll make you <laughs> a little happy. Me. I do know there are players who are working on that. So nice. Oh, okay, I'm now I'm excited for yeah. it. <laughs> so that's basically the vintage meta game. So I think one more archetype we want to explore here is combo. Um, combo these days, at least to me, means either breach if it's like dedicated breach, not like Serox breach, uh, if that's even a thing. Uh, the dedicated breach and I guess PO. PO is the big one, right? Paradoxical um, outcome. For those who don't know, that's well. yeah. oh, it's Doomsday as well. That's a good yeah. point. Um, I guess most people here would know Doomsday. Paradoxical outcome is a card that doesn't really show up outside of Vintage, and that's an instant for three colorless and a blue, and you can bounce when it resolves any number of target. I think it's non-land permanents from your non-token side of the board. A non-land. Oh, a non-token. Yeah, so you can't yeah. bounce your mentor permanents, and yeah. you draw a card for that. So, Justin, how do you abuse that? Uh, well, you get to play Moxon. And Moxon <laughs> will quickly turn your POs uh, from casting four mana to casting for basically zero. Um, a, a, a powerful turn one play could be something like uh, Mox Ruby, Mox Sapphire, Mox Opal, Land, cast Paradoxical Outcome for three, uh, for four mana, but really you're playing those Moxon back again, so do you only cast it for one. So it's like a super powerful repeal, you know, repeal a card that we've seen do this like on a small scale. Yeah, it's, it's it does kind of have a similar thing to those like uh, Saram decks in Modern where you're playing your zero drops and you're drawing cards, except your zero drops are actually playable magic cards because Moxen <laughs> are <laughs> incredible, obviously. Yeah, that 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 deck's really amazing. I actually played that two years ago, and it felt like the best thing ever. Um, I played the the Esper version back then, which you actually also ran back in in the tournament. So we're gonna talk a little bit about about your experience in the tournament weekend and that deck later on. But yeah, that that's also Doomsday, and Doomsday I guess is also one of the best decks in the format right now. It it, it felt that way when I was playing. Oh, for sure. Uh, there was definitely a point where people were arguing that it it had to have something taken out of it or restricted because it was. Uh, completely dominating challenges over and over again there are a couple of really really talented magic online pilots who play doomsday um most of them are actually from japan uh discover n is the big one that comes i think to mind. i've never seen discover n not top eight a, a <laughs> challenge like <laughs> there was a, there was a section in time where if you went to discover n's mtg finishes it was just all top eights for weeks and months on end <laughs> playing it's doomsday insane. it's just incredible yeah. And so I think people have kind of figured it out a little bit now, are being a little bit more respectful of it. So it's kind of been toned down a bit, but it's still, I think, one of the top tier decks. And it actually represents a pretty big metagame portion. When you look at that Ritual metagame percentage, uh, Ritual is Doomsday and DPS. And DPS is a very small metagame percentage. It's not the strongest deck in, in Vintage. So it's mostly dominated by Doomsday decks. And so it's just you know right behind the PO decks and right behind just traditional Xerox decks as maybe you know one of the third most played archetypes. Sub archetypes. Awesome, awesome. So between those decks that we talked about, is there is there any kind of like I call it a rock paper scissors thing going on? Are, are there any decks that are quite significantly favored over the others, or is it pretty straightforward? Yeah, it was worse, or that was more prevalent traditionally, where um, your your, Z- your Xerox deck would lose to the shop deck, which would lose to. Hmm. Dredge, maybe? I, well, no, your Shop Shack should probably be Dredge. Maybe it was the combo deck, but I'm thinking this, well, it was a little rough for a time because Shops pay, beat everything. <laughs> 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 that was true for a very long time in Vintage. Recently, it, it goes more like the uh, the Xerox oh, Oath, Oath, right? Sorry to interrupt you there. Like, uh, historically, <laughs> at least for me playing, um, when I played Shops five years ago, ten years ago, uh, Oath was always the one that you were scared of because you like mm. you often just couldn't beat them because they just needed to get to two mana. But like, then I guess Cage came along and that helped a little bit. Yeah. So the, the big thing that changed was was Po. Uh, what Po did was made a combo deck that beat Shops. And so when your Po deck beats Shops, uh, but your Po deck loses to Xerox, which then loses to Shops, that was kind of the 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 circle that was going on. And then you would throw Dredge in there where. Your Dredge would beat your Xerox deck, but it would lose to Shops, then it would be pretty close versus Pio. Uh, but that's all kind of been thrown for a wrench recently, where I don't feel like the the Jeskai and the Xerox decks lose to Shops all that badly. Um, one of the big reasons for that is Shattering Spree and Dreadhorde Arcanists. I think that as long as you respect your Shops matchup, it ends up being pretty close, which is weird for a deck that sometimes plays four Pyroblasts in the main deck. 
against a <laughs> completely colorless deck. So, uh, and so that, that that kind of idea of rock paper scissors somewhat exists, and, and, but it's not as extreme, I think, as it used to be. Uh, some of these decks are are you know closer to fifty percent versus each other than they than they were in the past. Awesome. That as you keep talking about. Um, if I wasn't already playing Vintage and Magic Online, I would definitely get into it right now because that sounds amazing. Um, are, there, are there any, like, I call it tensions going on in Vintage right now. Is there anything that people are saying, hey, maybe we need to unrestrict this card or maybe we need to restrict this card or is, is everybody living in happy harmony until the end or something? Uh, there's always going to be some amount of unrestrict, restrict talk in Vintage. It just kind of goes with the format, unfortunately. Um, while everyone agrees that the numbers look really good and, and the numbers are are very very good there's a lot of talk about um if bizarre decks if the current bizarre decks create unhealthy games of magic or unfun games of magic um one of the main reasons for this is is hollow one hollow one uh for those who you don't know is a five cost four four that uh starts to cost less when you discard cards so when you discard your three cards to your bizarre of baghdad you suddenly have a free four four that doesn't care about opponent's ley lines of the void it doesn't care about opponent's rest in peace or graph digger's cage or any kind of hate that you would traditionally bring in for a bizarre or graveyard based combo deck um so what hollow one does is it's a main deck alternative game plan and and it really negates or or helps mitigate the idea that if i bring in enough cards against my dredge opponent or my or my hollow mine opponent or my hogak opponent that I'll be able to hate them out of the format, which has traditionally been true for Ver Vintage. If you just brought enough cards for Bizarre and respected enough, you could beat your Bizarre opponent. Um, that's just not super true anymore. There will be games where you have multiple pieces of graveyard hate for sometimes. I've, I've lost a game where I had like four pieces of graveyard hate, and they just went turn one, double hollow one, kill you in a couple turns. <laughs> and so it's, it's gone to the point where it feels like the best uh, hate against all the graveyard decks is actually the Tabernacle, right? Because of the existence of hollow one. Like, maybe Leyland's better against Dredge than Tabernacle, but I don't know. I, I just see that as almost like the premier bizarre hate. So that's, like, kind of an interesting conversation because it's true to a point where about, oh, man, a couple of metagame cycles ago when when Holovine, like, I, I can talk about it a little bit earlier, where Holovine was starting to really become the deck to beat, um, everyone, you know, discovered that Tabernacle was the best way to beat that deck because they didn't play mana sources so they couldn't pay for all their free creatures Mm -hmm. Uh, and so everyone started playing tabernacles then for a while there were decks every deck had two tabernacles in their board every single deck no matter what archetype sometimes even the hollow vine decks had two tabernacles in their board for (laughs) the mirror yeah and so things got really wild uh and everyone started to play more surgical distractions and tabernacles and they really honed down on what cards were really good against grid stretch and hollow vine and, and it actually really pushed dredge out of the meta until these decks adapted and learned that oh i need to play all these wastelands in the main oh i can play some Gaia's cradles in the main which will offset the tabernacle uh, and, and the decks did adapt and we actually i think come full circle to where tabernacles are really beatable from those decks they they're really prepared to to deal with the tabernacle and the pilots are a lot better at at holding back when they need to and not putting their hollow ones into play when they're at uh you know they're they're liable to a yeah, that makes sense. It feels funny in a way. Like to me, it almost feels like Tarmogolf is the best graveyard hate in Vintage right now <laughs> <laughs> because it, it blocks the Hollow One and a lot of the other stuff they could throw away, you know, like like yeah, Wrench Wines and Basking Root Waters and everything. I've had that card present a problem to me when I played the deck. Actually, it's like the best shops often. hate as well. It's it's so weird how insane Tarmogolf is in Vintage. <laughs> like it, do- it doesn't make sense on a very basic level with no other knowledge of what goes on in the format but i was trying the bug deck bef- uh, before the eternal weekend as well and i was like god i keep dt'ing for tarmogoyf what is going on I, it's just it's just exactly <laughs> what you want in like a lot of the matchups it's crazy so uh, tarmogoyf yeah. good old goyf I, just keep keeping it, i can't uh, <laughs> i can't bring myself to register a tarmogoyf keep it in real. my vintage deck <laughs> you, you said something in your stream recently that that sounded um exactly like that right i think you said something like along the lines of so how do you come into Vintage? You see all these cards, and then you say, I want to cast Tarmogoyf. 
<laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> it, it's bad because I, I acknowledge that it's being played for a reason, and it, it's very good at doing what it's meant to do. It being a lot of times a four five or a five six that blocks these hollow ones and, and, and these these creatures, but it's just really not what I want to be doing when <laughs> when I sleeve up a vintage deck. <laughs> It does what it's supposed to do. Like if a teacher wrote that on your end of year report or something, you would know exactly what they meant by that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tomography, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I was wondering, are there, are there any other decks coming back up again? Um, specifically, you know, like Dred Dredge and Ravager Shops, because from the numbers, they haven't been played all that much recently. But we, we, we saw like Dredge take down the second event, actually. Which was somewhat surprising to me because I figured it, it might be this almost strictly inferior Bazaar deck. But yeah, th that's one thing that happened. And like the second one, I actually myself played Ravager Shops just because I've, I've always loved that deck and I, I won an MKM with it. And I felt like, hey, that's, I don't know, I really love that kind of play style that's that putting pressure on my opponents and and making pu putting them to tough decisions and everything and having all these like m cool things, these cool interactions that you can do to maybe outplay them um doesn't always work that way but i gotta say the deck felt insanely good to me i just, uh, jumped into a challenge afterwards like randomly when i saw the challenge was coming up in your stream and i won that challenge with ravager shops as well and ravager shops also took down the the third tournament in the hands of static Crypt. and i don't know maybe this is just like my biased outside of you but i felt like ravager shops was insanely good especially since you know you don't barely ever face these these um, energy flux kind of cards anymore. I mean, you still face spot removal, but it feels like Ravager Shops is better at beating spot removal than than other kind of shop stacks. But yeah, that's that's basically my question to you. Um, what do you think about Dredge and Ravager Shops um, making making their putting their name out there? I, I feel like you've been looking at the recent data because these are the exact two decks that I would say are coming back up again. <laughs> Actually, I didn't. I just I just looked oh. at the top one and posted over here. <laughs> so Dredge. Um, you won't see Dredge in the Vintage uh, Eternal Weekend data because the play size was too small. There weren't enough pilots on it. But among the pilots that did play Dredge, among the two Eternal Weekends that we have data for, the win rate was close to 60%, which is very high. And the data we don't have for Eternal Weekend 2, we know that uh, that Eternal Weekend was won by Dredge. Actually, in the challenges following Eternal Weekend, Dredge has put up incredible numbers. Uh, in the most recent Sunday challenge, Dredge was four of the top eight. Jeez. So, <laughs> so Dredge, I, I'm not going to lie, I think in my review, because I did a nice like two and a half hour long review of the vintage archetypes before Eternal Weekend, I'm pretty sure I said Dredge was the <laughs> inferior bizarre deck. Um <laughs> But what, well, what, what I th think... That is definitely your fault. Every time you make a cool show like that, it just it backfires. <laughs> it's just how things go. So, What I think yeah, the reason is... Our podcast is... once famously skipped reviewing Oko because we wanted to talk about playable cards instead. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't the only podcast that did that. The vintage, uh, the big vintage podcast also missed Oko, I think. <laughs> I, I was playing Oko within the first week or so. It was out, so should have had me on then. Is ah. it even a testament to the card being good? Mm, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what i think the real reason behind dredge's resurgence is that thing that we talked about earlier how people are bringing tabernacles and surgicals to beat the vine decks and dredge can adapt to tabernacle pretty well and surgical is just not good enough it, that, that's that kind of hate is not good enough you need to be playing ley line and, and cage and needle and and rest in peace and these kind of these kind of cards to stop the dredge uh, engine and so I think that Dredge is really right now preying upon people not respecting it, which is a very classic thing for Dredge to do. I love it. It's weird to think that Dredge could prey on this metagame because there are like so many bizarre decks, but it, the way you describe it makes perfect sense. I guess I haven't looked at any of the lists, but I guess they're doing stuff like Ashen Rider for Tabernacle. Is it stuff like that? Or how are they? Like that. A lot of times, they, I mean, they, they up their, they're up sense. the Wasteland count uh, right. in the yeah. main deck. Uh, one of the things they've been doing recently is they've adopted more creeping chills so they can mm. play a faster game plan. Um, so a Tabernacle, while it will wipe away the current board, it's not going to stop the Icarids and, and creeping chills from, from finishing you off, basically. Nice. I like it. Well, that's actually what happened with Wizards 2002. Um, if you don't want to hear any of the spoilers yet, just skip over the next minute or two. Um, but in Eternal Weekend 2, in the finals, when he played against Gershi, which I think is Emmanuel Gershenson, 
uh, like yeah. a pro, it semi-pro is, yeah. player. And Rizard was playing against Doomsday. And what he managed on the very last turn, he could do something. He dredged into just enough Creeping Chill to put Emmanuel, I think, at one life, which meant he couldn't cast Doomsday anymore. And yeah, that, that was like an amazing finish to, to, nice. to that match. I've just been incredibly impressed with the Creeping Chills. I, I know a couple... Um, couple of dredge pilots on magic online like uh pr gg jr jerry i believe uh i think they started playing creeping chills or at least one of the first players who started playing creeping chills and some of these decks are even um skimping on things like force of negation to play creeping chills which i think is crazy to me because force of negation <laughs> is just a wildly broken card <laughs> awesome man so really happy to see dredge coming back uh, what do you think about ravager shops does that deck have legs as well or is it like gonna gonna be a fad it's a little hard because Ravager Shops does struggle very heavily versus PO, and it struggles pretty heavily versus Force of Vigor. And and it, it, you're right, it has seen like some pretty decent results recently. The Car Shops decks have been able to kind of pressure these Planeswalker decks a little bit better. Um, so I think it's less about Ravager Shops being good and more about it being in a decent spot versus the metagame decks. Um, I think I think that with the printings of Modern Horizons shops has struggled immensely force of vigor and collector oof uh collector oof more towards the ravager shops not the golo shops uh, but force of vigor towards both obviously um have really held back shops from having a, a really high win percentages as, along with the thing we were talking about earlier with the shattering spree and dreadhorgan arcanist out of the fair blue decks mm-hmm. so uh, while i don't think ravager shops is as bad as people say it is and i, I even played a, a prelim recently with it, it it's still i think not the best thing you can be doing if you want to be winning. <laughs> yeah, that that sounds right. Like I, I was actually gonna play um, uh, chess guy, chess guy Xerox, but yeah. then I only had like four hours of sleep, and I was like, you know what? Let's just rubber child up again. <laughs> and yeah, that that I, I think I lost my win it, and so that that felt pretty good. But yeah, may, maybe I'll eventually run to into a thing where I realize, okay, the deck isn't as good as I think it is because right now it feels like insane. You got like Sphere, Sphere, Tangle Wire, Sphere, Wasteland. Like I, I really just like attack for two or four every turn, but my opponent literally sometimes doesn't cast a single spell in the entire match. And I realize that's not how it always plays out, I guess. <laughs> it is is a very draw dependent deck. You don't get to, you don't get to play your preordains. So you don't have a choice. Your, your, your big choices are kind of like Tron and Modern where you, your, your, your mulligan decision is a, is a large part of your game and then after you're mulliganing it's how well are you sequencing your threats versus your opponent what is your opponent going to do i know it came up recently i just played against um oath in that preliminary with ravager shops and and i misevaluated how good um how important sphere was in the current board state to graph digger's cage i was like okay graph digger's cage against oath that's that's the most important but it turned <laughs> out because of my opponent's mana situation that i should have valued spear for uh sphere first so um, I think Ravager Shops is a hard, is a much harder deck than people give it credit for. I actually think it's a really challenging deck to play optimally. Maybe it has a, a high skill floor, but um, the deck the deck is is hard. I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. And one last question: Why is nobody playing Oath anymore? Because that, at least in my experience, used to be one of the most played decks in the format, and now it's sitting at like four percent. I usually give two reasons. I think one, Force of Vigor exists. Uh, that card is really that, that I, card I, has a I, lot of influence. Apparently, I, I think Force of Vigor has completely changed the vintage meta game forever. Along with Force of Negation, um, these two cards really change what is good and what you can be doing. And, and I think that's one of the big reasons. I think another reason is I just don't think that Oath is as powerful as the other things you're doing. Um, o- Oathing into a Grizzlebrand or a Niv Mizzet or a Grizzlebrand and a Stinks of the Steel Wind or something like that is that as powerful as casting Doomsday and winning the game? Casting PO and winning the game, Tinker winning the game, it just doesn't seem like it's the case. I will say <laughs> I played the uh, Oath Breach deck, which Anorag and Ved made, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't do too well in the the main Eternal Weekend that I played, just because I definitely made mistakes. But then I was playing um, a league to the side and five would that, and I played a couple more matches, and it felt pretty good to me because when you hit the Oath, you win that turn. So that was like a, a big deciding factor in feeling good. You're right. If you, you if you like hit a grizzle brand, then you have to win off that. It's it's beatable by a lot of decks. But I don't know that one seemed pretty powerful to me. As I I think the oath builds that are playing not prim- primary oath where they're playing I, I call them combo oath builds. So PO oath and breach okay. oath. I think those decks are slightly better. 
I still yeah. don't know if those decks are better than just playing PO or Breach is my biggest That's problem. Fair. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I'm going to continue shouting out different vintage players, but <laughs> if if you want to see good Oath play, the best Oath play, Miharu Fuyamiya is a Japanese uh, VTuber who is easily the best Oath player on Magic Online, probably in the entire world. So there's plenty of really high quality Oath games. They used to win a lot uh on magic online they they even struggled pretty recently i just don't think oath is just doesn't seem like oath is in a great place it's nice having like a an expert on a deck because then when you start seeing them do badly then you can like feel justified <laughs> that you think it's bad but i've, I've definitely seen their name all the time they play like rug or four color versions right like it's usually the, uh, the uh what i call control oath it's oko yeah. oath so rug with um a large number of planeswalkers and counter spells so these decks are mm-hmm. heavy heavy pyroblasts force of negation um that kind of that kind of sweet veil of summer sweet we got a listener question with regards to more like general points about vintage right now i think the first one from oliver first we already kind of answered Basically, he's asking, as the decks are so incredibly powerful and vintage, is it more of a coin flip than playing it out? Uh, I already talked about how it feels like the matches can go incredibly deep, especially when you're playing like the, the quote-unquote fair mirrors going mm-hmm. really deep. But also with PO, like I, like I mentioned, I've seen you go to like beyond turn 20 with PO. I think that that's, that's such a common misconception um, for Legacy as well, but especially Vintage, where... If you're if you're losing on turn one, then like consistently and too much, that it's not like the the numbers have proved like we were talking about before that the, this is not a problem of the format so far. I believe Justin, you correct me if I'm wrong, but rather than if you're losing a lot on turn one, then maybe it's your deck that doesn't have enough answers to what the powerful things the format is presenting you, um, or you just haven't played enough, or you know you could just be not mulliganing enough like you're keeping slower hands whatever like there's a lot of reasons why you could lose on turn one that it's not actually the format's fault and um yeah like likewise there's just the games go so long when i was trying the bug deck like i was just going to turn 15 often like it's it's so slow and grindy yeah i think an important aspect there is not only how often you lose on turn one and how how long the games go which which i just talked about earlier but i think also about how much agency you actually have because if a game goes like to turn 10 but it felt like you didn't really have any agency because there was a ley line and you couldn't beat the ley line and then you attack with your hollow wine like i don't know a couple of times <laughs> it's true that doesn't yeah. feel like that feels more like a coin flip right yeah ag- agency you, is a better way of putting it definitely yeah and at least to me it felt like decks except like the basara decks don't always have the greatest agency um especially if they're facing hate and they can't beat it right now but Overall, I feel like there's a lot of agency going on in the format. Is, is, is it not, Justin? I think all the things you guys are saying are are, are, are true and, and good points. I think one of the things that people... It's, a, it's an adjusting factor when you enter Vintage. You, you need to be able to roll with the punches a little more in, in, than other formats. You have these restricted cards that are clearly some of the most powerful things you can be doing. And, and they won't come up every game. But sometimes your opponent will have Black Lotus Ancestral demonic tutor yog will do it again and you just have to kind of accept that you'll have some of those and they'll have some of those and so there are there obviously are games that are are coin flips or or you don't have as much agency but i think that in the current state of vintage those games happen less than people would normally think and i think the majority of these games are are going really long especially when you're playing or at least especially if one side is playing one of the fair decks they're going to stop you. They have really good tools to stop you from doing your powerful things. You keep mentioning uh, PO versus fair decks, and you really have to pick your spots versus Pyroblast decks as a PO player. You have to be like, all right, this is this is now my time. And sometimes your time is on turn one, and, and sometimes your turn is on, your time is on turn twenty. Yeah, and for that, I, I really want to shout out the coverage once again. That's going to be on Magic.gg because you. I think we had you on camera twice and both of those games were, were absolutely insane. I think especially your second game in round eight of the second yeah. thing of the library challenge or the library turn weekend, that might have been the best game of the of the entire Legacy and Vintage weekends combined because that was insane. And that was actually like PO against the fair deck. And yeah, shout outs to that. Uh, looking at all the... Oh, actually, they, 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 Oliver had one more question. Um, how strong do you think Wasteland and Vintage is compared to Legacy, as there are a lot of mana artifacts that can be utilized and that allow you to dodge land destruction. And I guess that also segues into his third question. 
are there any non-powered decks that are competitive? Decks that make relying on mana artifacts a drawback. So can you walk us through this? I guess it's a less of a thing on Magic Online because, you know, in, in pay-per-view stuff, this tradition of the best unpowered deck, the best budget right. deck would earn something special. And Vintage, that's not a thing anymore. The cards are more accessible. But do, do those decks still show up every once in a while? And do they rely on Wasteland? Um, so to start, Wasteland is really, really good in Vintage right now. <laughs> I think Wasteland is probably the best it's been in, since I started playing Vintage. Um, there's tons of people in the uh, Vintage streaming Discord right now who, who complain a lot about Wasteland. Uh, it, it actually does a really good job of, of keeping your opponent from casting spells. A lot of these mana bases can't afford to have multiple basics. Some are just one island. Some are zero island. Uh, Shops sometimes doesn't play a basic. Uh, there's, uh, Bizarre decks are definitely not going to play a basic. Uh, and Wasteland is a, r- a great tool to stop Bizarre from, from doing its unfair things. So I, I actually think that Wasteland decks in general in Vintage right now are, are a great place to be. They're not typically decks that I like to play, but like if you see the numbers and you see how well Bug is doing as a Wasteland deck, it's it's uh, it's really impressive. And that kind of segues into the second question about non-powered decks. And historically, you could play decks like um, like Eldrazi that play Null Rods, and and you could you could rely on or like Merfolk and and Null Rods and and play these kind of tribal aggro decks that that use Null Rod to stop your opponent from doing unfair things and. I don't really think that that's just the case anymore. I, I think with the level of power that the new cards are presenting, I, I think these decks have kind of just fallen out. The, the Null Rod aggro decks don't seem to be as competitive as they used to be, um, which is, I think, unfortunate. And maybe that could be remedied with something like a, a Thorn on Restriction, but it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. So, yeah, I, I, I wish that these kind of no rod non-power decks were a little bit more competitive than they are but it it just doesn't really to me seem like that's the case even the the powered eldrazi decks are have just completely faded away from the metagame yeah maybe there's also like just no incentive to test them in the first place right and unless there was like a paper tournament coming up where there's actual reason and incentive to try to to build your i don't know gadok teak green white hate bear deck whatever that's like what people used to do but uh, right now, there's just like no incentive to do those. Those, those decks so. did exist at the GP side events very often. True, <laughs> that's where they really, really did well. But yeah, I I guess it's really good that you actually brought up um humans because I I mean I don't exactly consider these decks to be non powered because they really rely on Moxon to play turn one Thalia, but there's a group of really dedicated vintage humans players they have a discord and and they they try out all all kinds of unplayable humans in their decks <laughs> they've tried every card i swear in magic that can uh, be considered a hate bear what's the worst and, one you've seen oh one of them really likes the slippery bog slippery bog tender slipper it's like a four mana um, thing that gives things hexproof or something i don't even know what it's called <laughs> god S- S- slippery bog something I, I would have to look it up yeah, and, it's not coming to and me. like I understand, they're like they have like they have logic and reasoning to back up why they're playing this. It's for this certain matchups where like Assassin's Trophy and these kind of things, and, and it all like logically makes some amount of sense. But the card is just like so not <laughs> powerful <laughs> compared to the other things that are going on. This but is the I'm, ghost story again. <laughs> I, I'm shouting them out because they do put up pretty reasonable results. I believe one of those kind of you know Maverick style green white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, attack bullshit. um i believe he lost his winning and went in the top eight in one of the eternal weekend events so nice. like I, I, i'll clown on i'll clown on these decks just like i clown on the goif decks but uh, there's a reason that they you know continually put up you know decent results nice <laughs> Uh, a budget deck that actually it wasn't a budget deck that we've seen on coverage for the third event was actually elves but they did play i think a mox and black lotus even though i guess you could run that deck without them and that deck looked like it totally destroyed the buck deck because the buck deck <laughs> like there was like ne- like the buck deck could never win in the red zone i guess the best thing the buck deck could do is is have like leovold to stop like the glimpses and but then eventually uh, they just like overran them and like everything was uncountable the buck deck couldn't keep up with enough removal spells for the other star shepherds and stuff that was that was something else um, i would probably build the f stack that's gonna be on coverage you can probably already see it on wizards website quite differently i would probably try to abuse 
I don't know, skull clamp because that cut seems so broken, but I, I really don't know. <laughs> like, it's just like some random thoughts that are coming up on my side that, right now. That, that, that is worth bringing up. Like, the vintage decks are incredibly tailored to beat each other. So, yeah, uh, these decks ha- have some suboptimal cards in them. I would say are, are, are not the most powerful cards in them because they are extremely good at a certain matchup. And, and these bug decks have to be really pointed to beat to beat Pio and Doomsday and Shops and Bazaar. These are extremely powerful opponents, so they might have holes in them where, where well, yeah, your bug player might not be able to beat the Elves opponent. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for some of that, definitely check out, um, I think it was round two or round three of the Michelle's Workshop event, and that's going to be on the website, and we're going to link to that in the show notes. It was, it was an early round because the bug date lost, I assume, so then you couldn't <laughs> find any more bug coverage. <laughs> <laughs> well, no spoilers here. Okay. Uh, so speaking of the events, I think we are, we're, um, there's no reason to really go into detail on all the, uh, what's three times eight? It's very early in the morning, 24 on all the 24 or rather 23 because Echo Baron got disqualified. Uh, I think we're probably not going to talk too much about those decks right now unless there's any deck to you that stands out because otherwise I'd just rather focus on, on Justin's deck since we have Justin here and we can break his brain about Esper <laughs> products of the outcome. Sure. Does it work for you guys? Awesome. Yeah, works for me. Awesome. So, yeah. Justin, you top aided the second event, the Library of Alexandria event, playing Paradox of the Outcome. You had an insane run in the Swiss. I think you were like nine and zero at some point. And then you, you lost it. Or did you? Did you actually ten zero the Swiss? I actually don't remember. No, I got crushed by a, I think a Golos player in round ten. The wheels all fell off after the first nine. We'll just only talk about those, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, that, that was quite the like a really amazing run. I think you also did really well in the first and the third event. I I think overall you had like a really good weekend, right? Yeah, uh, I seven two the first event and breakered out of. I might even I think breakered out of top sixteen. Even though I had a record that you know is equal, equivalent to a top eight player, that's just kind of how Magic Online works. <laughs> uh, and then I went nine one and lost in the top eight to Doomsday. And then in the final event, I went like six four or something like that. Oh, and you 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 played um, a meme deck, right? You you had your oh no, not a meme deck, but a meme <laughs> I mean, card choice. You had your uh, chat, chat allow uh, you to pick something. Yeah, yeah. I played Esper again, but I was getting a little bored. So I, I put in a, a, sub, <laughs> a, a sub goal of can we flip the Aereo uh, nice. Sorotami Ascendant? <laughs> for those who don't know, that's yeah, that, that's a creature. And if you play your fourth turn of the uh, your fourth spell of the turn, then it flips and it becomes an enchantment and counters the first spell your opponent plays every turn. That's how it works, right? Yeah, we flipped it in like round seven or eight, so (laughs) a win in my book. (laughs) That was such a good moment as well, because you flipped it and you were like, oh my god, what does my opponent do now? And chat just like came with one after another, after another, after another (laughs) thing they can do. And you're like, god, this is so bad, what the fuck are we doing? (laughs) It's a a little bit of a throwback, because I I actually did win that that TMD open with with one in my deck. Oh, awesome. So it's It's one of my favorite cards ever. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, in speaking of your deck, you are basically the how would you call that the champion of Esper Paradox the Outcome. You've been playing that deck a lot, and I think some people were some. I guess we can't really say people were surprised you were playing that because, like you mentioned, you also won the like vintage showcase pro tour yeah. mythic invitational thingy that qualified <laughs> you. <laughs> the big thing, right? You, oh you yeah, played the big that thing. Deck. Yeah, it just happened so that Bryant like made a big name for for four color. Is it even fourth color? Like looking at it right now, it actually looks more like three color. It's four, it's four color. It's it's splashing red for uh, pyroblast and cyborg cards. And in the main deck, it plays blue and black. And it plays white it? for a uh, monastery mentor. I think you're looking at a a different list. Oh, I picked the wrong list. Okay, I just picked the most recent Brian list from Magic Online, but uh, apparently he he's going he's going Grixis now. That's that's, that's his a, uh that's his third Eternal Weekend list. He he swapped it up a little bit. Uh, looks like everybody was swapping up in the thirty minutes. So okay, so <laughs> the, you you said you you're playing the Esper list, and the four color list usually plays white for the mentor as well. So what actually makes you makes you play the Esper list? And I mean, not having access to Pyroblast is a, is quite a big deal, right? Right. I've talked about this a couple of times on stream, but basically uh, I've piloted the Esper list for over two years now. Um, it's it's just my bread and butter. It's the thing that I'm most comfortable with. And I'm really, I feel I'm pretty adept at tuning the deck to be a pointed metagame. Uh, if, if you look at something like my 
uh, showcase qualifier victory where I qualify for the Pro Tour. I had an incredibly uh, combo centric or, or, or a deck built to be a combo centric metagame. So I had like a Mind Break Trap in my main deck. I had Mystic Remoras, uh, multiple, like three Lavinias in the 75. And, and I feel really comfortable bringing cards in and out and, and choosing which which cards are the right choice for a metagame. And I, I don't have a problem with Brian's list. I think Brian's list is really strong. Um, the results that Brian has put up with the list are obviously incredible. And I actually think Brian's list does really well against a, a wide variety of, of different kind of vintage metagames and fields. Um, my biggest problem with... There's basically two problems with that in my mind about playing the Red Splash. And one is it's it forces you to play two Volcanic Islands, which I don't want to do. I want to be able to play two Islands in my deck to make sure my deck is still good versus shops. Uh, I think it's really important to have the second basic. I, like I said earlier in the podcast, Wasteland is really strong right now. And, and giving your opponent an extra avenue to, to cut you off of colors is, is not all you want to be doing, especially when people are threatening your, your Moxin with, with Shattering Sprees and, and, and Oofs and Fragmentizes and stuff like that. Uh, and then my second thing is that <sighs> Pyroblast is really strong. It's no doubt about it. Pyroblast is really strong at, at, at hindering players' blue game plans. It's incredibly strong versus P.O., and my biggest problem is that Pyroblast doesn't answer the two counter spells that players are bringing to beat PO. They don't doesn't answer Flusterstorm, and it doesn't answer opponents' Pyroblasts. Uh, it, it answers their forces and their force, their force of wills, and their force of negations. And so, what Pyroblast in my mind does is is ends up being a more uh, reactive card, or sorry, it's a more defensive card, where you're Pyroblasting their powerful blue spells that they're doing on their turn, but it doesn't really help you resolve your powerful blue spells as often as i would like i think that something like flusterstorm does a much better job of that and i actually think that's something that brian has brought up recently where he's upped his flusterstorm count um and and so i think there's like plenty of good reasons to be in red i think the lightning bolts in the sideboard help for collector roof and the sprite dragons give you a different game plan but i think i'm just much more comfortable in in tuning and and playing esper in a way that will be a pointed metagame um yeah carry on that makes perfect sense like uh, there's there's some other cards which are similar, like sometimes Veil of Summer is kind of like a, a card that looks so perfectly suited to a combo deck, but then actually the way the game plays out, the way it's reactive or proactive, it just doesn't quite fit the expectations and stuff. So, yeah, and, and as you said, the two islands makes perfect sense. It's it's how, I don't know, I again, watching your streams, I just saw you fetch them against uh, any Wasteland decks. And like by getting that unwastelandable land by the extra turn, to be able to cast your larger spells is just exactly what you want. You know what my favorite part about the Esper list is? What I want to be doing with the Esper list all the time, it's ch- casting Knight's Whisper. When, when I played that like two years ago, <laughs> Knight's Whisper felt so good. Right, and that's that's a... a Knight's Whisper actually feels... It's a little weird, but it kind of feels a similar role to Pyroblast and that it's, it's going to be good versus the other blue decks, or at least the fair blue decks. And, and the reason you're playing Knight's Whisper instead of something like Preordain... Um, is that you have play all these off-color mocks and you're playing your full five full five mocks and a lot of the times you'll have a, a, a green mocks and or, or, or a red mocks and on turn one and you can use that in conjunction with your underground sea to draw two cards and drawing two cards in this deck is way more powerful than scrying and drawing one uh, because PO really cares about card quantity. Uh, it's really important that you have the number of moxen you need to turn your PO from an unplayable standard card into a, a vintage all-star. If your PO is not casting for picking up three permanents, it's really not doing uh, enough work to be justified in playing your deck. It's something I say on stream a lot that Paradoxical Outcome is a lot of the times the worst card in this deck. A lot, a lot of the times <laughs> this deck is a Tinker deck that also has a Paradoxical plan. Um, you're going to win with Tinker, I think, a lot of the time, and then PO with a smaller amount of the time, actually. I guess this just helps with the overloading of Pyroblast targets and stuff as well. Well, yeah, Nice yeah. Whisper is very nice that it's not Pyroblastable, so you can yeah, start true, drawing true. more cards and not be at risk of being slowed down by your opponent's Pyroblast. Mm-hmm. So a play pattern that I've had come up when I played PO uh, was that you would just end of turn PO and your opponent's end step, and then you basically you force their hand, and no matter what they do, it's usually good for you. Is that something you'd still yep. do? Yeah. So uh, against these fair decks, you have to pick your spots really, really well. And a way to play around Force of Negation is to play something on another player's turn. 
Uh, it also is going to short that mana for on your turn. Uh, and Nice Whisper actually it supplements that game plan because to, to effectively pull off the Paradoxical on my opponent's end step, untap and do something on my turn, you need to have two payoff spells. Um, and so it's really important that you're, you're able to find your Tinker or your second PO where you can you can force their pyroblast you can have you can force them to use a pyroblast on their end step and they tap out on their mana and then on your turn you can play a second pyroblast with flusterstorm backup or a force of will backup or something awesome awesome yeah dude stats if i really really want to like invite anyone who's never played po before don't be scared by looking at the deck list i mean the deck has a ton of technical play to it but it feels so incredibly good to play this deck um if it is super broken as well, especially you have some draws which are just completely ridiculous. And then when you start going off, you you can just kind of, once you have the win already, you can just play loads of spells at random. It's really fun to play. <laughs> yeah. It feels like if, if you want to feel that you're playing Vintage, you play PO. It's it's either that or Ravager Shops for me. Like, I, I can't ever imagine playing anything. I, I, okay, I, I said I was going to play Chess Guy, but I mean, I ended up <laughs> playing Ravager Shops because I just love that deck too. But PO, that, oh, it feels so healthily broken if that makes a sense okay. yeah pe- yes. people definitely have described it to me as the most vintage of decks mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it feels very totally. vintage yeah. and, and you're, you're and not planning on playing tarmogoyf in this deck anytime soon no <laughs> I, I say that as i have played tarmogoyf in the sideboard of apo version in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I, i've i think i've played almost every kind of color combination and set of cards you can play in po one of my favorites um mana gorger hydra Oh yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> two and a green for a one-one trampler. Whenever any player casts a spell, put a one-one counter on it. Um, particularly important for uh, one of the last Eternal weekends. Uh, the one that I don't know if that's actually the one that Brian won. <laughs> that might not be the one. That... Brian's been that's in so many. Us. Brian Covell has been in so many top eights. I can't remember now. Oh, um, and I know the one you mean. I, I, yeah, I also can't so... remember if it's the last one or the one before. But he was playing <laughs> so... PO with them. Yeah. Yeah, so I made a, back in the Narset metagame, a very dark and scary time for PO players because you can't draw any cards when there's a Narset in play. And if there are four Narsets in your opponent's deck, you're never casting a <laughs> PO for value. Um, I, I actually made a rug version of PO that played main deck Grape Shot, uh, Lightning Bolt, uh, Mana Gorger Hydras, and then it would board into f- the full four Mana Gorger Hydras post board against the Fair decks because they just weren't really equipped to deal with it at the time. And, and that deck actually put two players into Eternal Weekend Top 8, and I was really, I was really happy That's with sick. that. It's nice. such a cool, it was such a cool variant, because I think that PO obviously is a strong enough card that you can build around it, and if the metagame really changes, you can change to, to change with it, you know? Yeah. Speaking of card choices, um, I've got your list in front of me. Did you make any that were especially for Eternal Weekend? Like, I can see one big card in the sideboard that sticks <laughs> out to me. Was there anything else, though? And talk about that one as well. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I was expecting kind of a similar metagame to what's going on now with, with, with Bug and these kind of decks, but also Combo. And, and the big the big change is a lot of these PO decks will have a main deck bowl is the Citadel to tinker into, and then in sideboard, you have the option of changing your tinker target or adding a tinker target and playing Blightsteel Colossus. And and to do, and the reason you do that is because Blightsteel Colossus is very good against decks that are attacking you uh, or decks that are prohibiting you from casting many spells in a turn. So uh, Workshop, Dredge, uh, these kind of decks, you would always bring in your Blightsteel Colossus. And something I noticed was the current builds of Bug, Hollow Vine, Hogak Vine, um, could not beat a Sphinx of the Steel Wind, which is a large Shards of Alara artifact that's like a 6-6 six, six flying, first strike, vigilance, but very specifically pro-red, pro-green. Yeah. Um, pro-green so especially is what's just sticking Pro-green out, is, like, yeah. is the big one, but it, pro-red also important because pro-green is pro-force of vigor, pro-oko, pro-assassin's trophy. Pro-red is pro dac Faden. <laughs> pro shattering spree pro pyroblast so what you end up with is when you play a sphinx of the steel wind versus hogak vine they have no non-green answers to it it's so perfect they have to go through it <laughs> this is basically progenitus if it had vigilance and lifelink yeah. yeah it's it's so perfect because i was again watching your stream and like i saw it there and i was like, oh that's funny that's a, that's a cool thing i guess he's just trying it out instead of blight steel and then you were ex- explaining it to someone i was like god it just absolutely destroys the whole format currently amazing <laughs> it's so clever 
it was really a problem because traditionally you want to bring in blight steel versus hogak vine and hollow vine but a lot of times mm-hmm. they can just go around it they'll they'll be wide enough but they're not going around a a six six vigilancing life linker with first Absolutely strike. <laughs> no, no. And oh, if you end the, up watching the Eternal Weekend coverage, which I highly recommend, you'll you'll see that another uh, multicolor card in my sideboard did a lot of work, and that would be Camball Console of Allocation. That card was that card put put like. I, I, the card was like a two of back when I played it, and I was like so happy to see it still being a thing in Vintage because it never really made a splash in Legacy, even though I guess it could. But the problem is like the color combination isn't really great for Legacy, and three mana is also an issue. But in Vintage, and I, I guess we should mention what it does, it basically drains your opponent for two life every time they play. Is it a non-creature spell? Should be a non-creature spell. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and you would think like, okay, that's okay, whatever. Um, I guess they're going to lose a little bit of life, but... Over the course of several turns, and we mentioned how Vintage, especially in PO against Fairdex, takes a lot of time. That card single-handedly basically won you the game, and it's so funny. It could, like it, It's such a powerful card, but it can't be Pyroblasted. So right. that's just like another thing that those techs have to take care of, and they're already like in this weird spot right there. Technically, creature removal shouldn't be that great against you. I guess they want to take out Lavinia, but even Mentor, like taking out Mentor doesn't always work very well and might be like a minus UV losing battle. And now there's also Kambal, which they can't flash the storm, they can't pyroblast. They, 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 it, it's so awkward for them, and I, I'm loving everything everything about that card. Is, uh, are we considering like playing even more, or, or is it like a thing that might even go away again, or is, is this kind of mainstay in the deck? No, you're exactly right, and that's the exact reason we're playing it. It's the old switcheroo. I'm playing a combo deck that's not based on creatures. The only creatures they might care about are Lavinia, which is dealt with by Pyroblast, but Kambal very specifically, is not a blue creature. Um, and so when these decks like Jeskai take out all of their lightning bolts and their swords of plowshares, uh, the Camball might be unanswerable. Uh, and so you're either forcing them to keep in cards that are suboptimal against your deck or or just die to the Camball. Um, Camball has been around as an Esper PO sideboard tech for for many, for many at least the, the two years, past two years. Um, the reason it went away for a little while was uh, uptick in Caracas, uh, during the Luris metagame, there were Caracuses in everyone's main deck. <laughs> so uh, he went away for a while, but he's back. And P- and these Pyroblast players kind of have to respect that maybe the Esper Pio player is going to bring in a gamble. Awesome, awesome. Dude, I'm, I'm so in love with this deck. I, I, I really, I, I've once had a donation deck list request for Legacy where um, I was asked to come up with a Legacy version of Pio, and <laughs> I still don't know how to do that, but this vintage thing is... I'm probably going to stream it too. Um, I, I got to try to avoid your hours because you, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be streaming for like five people who just haven't discovered you yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually try to avoid hours where any other vintage streamers is, is, is going. I, I would rather continue everybody to, you know, I'd rather everybody learn and be able to see more vintage streamers than just watch me. So if I come home from work and someone's streaming vintage, I, w- I would rather direct them to them than to start up my own stream and maybe take away viewers or something like that. <laughs> there's there's enough time in the week that i can stream during a time where there isn't another vintage streamer going so awesome man uh, one more thing i want to ask you about is uh, mystic remora uh, that card yeah. used to be a thing like right when i started out playing legacy for f- almost 15 years ago that card actually like saw play every now and then in legacy but really? it quickly went away for a long yeah it, it was a I thing i didn't know that but Legacy also was like a, quite a lot slower and sure. you, you could like pay the upkeep for it quite a lot more. So what the card does, it it has a giant fish on it and that's pretty much it. That's, <laughs> that's all you card. need to know. It's enchantment, it costs one blue. Uh, it has cumulative upkeep one, so you pay one, two, three, four, five over, over a couple of turns. And whenever your opponent plays a non-creature spell, you draw a card unless they pay fucking four, which nobody ever does, I guess. <laughs> and that really puts your opponent in a, in a weird spot, right? Can you can you elaborate a little bit on, on the strategic value of that card? Yeah, so Mystic Marmora is one of my favorite anti-combo metagame technologies. <laughs> it, it was somewhat played previous to Luris, but it was really prevalent in the Luris metagame where you could just replay it after you didn't want to pay for it anymore with your Luris. Um, That's so sweet. But it, it went away because it is more traditionally played in the, the Esper builds than the four color builds. And I actually brought two of them to my main deck, I believe, for that uh, that vintage showcase where, where we qualify for the Pro Tour. 
because I it was going to be a doomsday or breach heavy field basically, and those decks sometimes they don't have the luxury of waiting until you can't pay for your remora anymore. Sometimes these PO decks with all their their fast mana they can pay for remora for six turns and they don't care at all. And then on the sixth <laughs> turn when they can't pay for it anymore, in your upkeep trigger on the stack PO my whole board back to my hand including the remora. <laughs> That's so sweet, man, dude. I'm I'm so in love with this. Callum, can you can you break the card for Legacy again? Remora or PO? Yeah. Remora, <laughs> well, both. Pro- probably the, same both? Even. <laughs> the problem with Remora <laughs> is sometimes you get people playing basic planes and Thalia, and then yeah, I guess it pitches to force the classic thing. Um, <laughs> I've I've tried to break PO a lot. Um, it's not gotten very far. It's it's really hard without Moxon. So you use like you can't use petal led because you don't have the mana acceleration so then it's a four mana card and chrome Mox is just like going down the cards so it's not doing much there's there's nothing like then there's grim monolith uh, i don't know would you, you say the, you... the closest po equivalent in legacy is that uh that echoes deck yeah it is doing kind of similar things i did actually make a build with po as well at the very beginning <laughs> like I mean, because I was trying to pick up Narsets and stuff and keep going yeah. with wheels and LEDs and stuff. And like you can do stuff, but that was just like too combo-centric and it just lost to any kind of hate. But um, yeah, PO, is, it really struggles in Legacy. I was trying to do it with um, an Ancient Tombs and Mentors, like a Mentor Stompy deck. Uh, that kind of was the best one I got to. It also played Arayus as well, so uh, it's got some similarities. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know, it's weird. Um, there must be good reasons why Remora is not played as much in Legacy. I think there's just the decks that could play it don't threaten to kill anywhere near as fast or efficiently as Vintage do. Is maybe a reason. Like you play it out and then it sits there for a couple of turns and your opponent's okay kind of playing draw go until you present something and yeah. yeah My... I guess the biggest the biggest issue is that Vana's like at a premium mm-hmm. in Legacy and if you if you even if you spend like two mana on your Remora and then you draw two cards of that, that's not even all that amazing. In that's true. Really. That's very true. Yeah, I, my I always postulate that the big reason is that you don't have Moxon and the PO deck is a deceptively good at paying for Remora. One of my favorite plays to make is you go Island Remora and they go well, they can only probably pay for this for a couple turns. Mm-hmm. And then the remora resolves, and you go mox, 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 <laughs> yeah. and then you go. Oh, I guess there's just a remora for the whole game. Totally. <laughs> so it's probably true for remora and PO that just it boils it's down just to moxen, really. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Awesome. So yeah, that's I think that's pretty much our our overview of vintage, our kind of intro to vintage, if if you want. Um, Callum, I, uh, how's your vintage? Eternal Beacon actually again. Uh, what did you end up playing? Yeah, so I played the the Oath Breach deck because. Oh, you mentioned that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I I tried playing almost every of the like the big players beforehand. I just missed a couple, and I think I went like two, three or worse in every league. It's definitely partly because I was playing fast just to get leagues in and get some familiarity again. And I I do keep up with the format to, to as much as I can. I don't know all the nuances and little like I would never have known about the Sphinx sideboard tech and stuff, but <laughs> I keep keep up enough to like know what decks are trying to do and things. And um yeah, nothing clicked. Bug, like I got two four ones first and I was like, okay, I can get this. And then I went like O three twice. And I was like, oh, I'm so off this. I'm so off Tarmogoyf. And so I just picked up the deck cold because I saw I saw Anorag playing it. It looked pretty fun. And then I think I just went like one two and dropped but both both losses were completely my fault. They were like pivotal turns where one of the matches I lost, I just forgot to fetch. I knew the top card of my library and needed to draw land. And another one I miscounted. And uh, I, this is really funny, I have to say it because it sounds so stupid. I, I sided out a brain freeze and then I pitched the second one to force thinking there's no way I need to use... Um, <laughs> there's no way I need to use a... Underworld Breach Kill because I had a Grizzle Brand in hand and I had like drawn cards and I had f- like access to four forces basically. And um, then my opponent played a Glacial Chasm, which I couldn't beat. <laughs> 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 so, so I was in this position where I was like, okay, I, I cannot beat this. I've pitched and sided out my brain freezes. Um, so the only way I could come up with a kill was targeting my opponent with Ancestral Recall a lot of times. 
And so the game went, it was a pretty sweet game. It went on for like five more turns while I was building up a big enough graveyard um, just by playing breaches and like doing stuff. So I was trying to build up a hand that could target my opponent, I think, it was 10 or 11 times with recall <laughs> while building up enough permission so that I can get through what they drew off being recalled a million times. And I almost got there. I missed it by one blue mana. So I was, oh. I, was I, I actually took screenshots at the beginning because like, God, if I pull this off, this is so sweet. But um, I think in reality, they, they probably had more stuff. Like I'd counted one or two veils. They had dazes. They had forces as well. It was like, oh, wow. It, it was tough, but it was it was pretty sweet. But I felt really stupid when like I'd pitched that brain freeze, like glacial chasm. God. So this is where like they were playing the uh, the crab, crab vine deck, yeah. not vine, uh, just crab, crab stuff. bond. I think it should be yeah, really and they had like the black retreat and stuff. Wait, that's actually a deck because I, I I've heard people talk about that. I think on my stream recently. Yeah. And for for those who don't know, it's basically fast bond, so you can play any number of lands, and you lose one life for ex for extra land drops. You mm -hmm. use one of those mill crabs that mill when land comes into play, and you use those Ravnica bounce lands. At least that's how I know it. So you yeah. can play like as many lands as you have life total, and you mill three every time. And yeah. technically, you can win on the first turn with that. That's I had no idea that's actually a deck. Yeah, game one, they just like killed me turn two with Lotus, <laughs> Lotus DT and then Fast Bond for um, Retreat to Hagra, which is whenever a land ETBs, you drain the opponent for one, and then a borrow Palace in the Clouds. Oh, and you, you pay zero, life to, uh, zero mana to put it back to your hand. Yeah, yeah, you have to pay one, but you can tap it for itself. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I thought the story that I tried to recall my opponent 12 times and lost was quite funny. <laughs> it's a very vintage story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I know the deck felt good, as I said, but just like me playing it, not very well. <laughs> but you, yeah, we talked about you doing pretty well. You won a challenge. You uh, went 7-2, did you? In the I, one I you think played? it was 8-2, eight, two, but eight, two. I, I don't remember. It was. I think might have been 7-2. I don't remember it was if it was 9 or 10 rounds. I think it was 10 and I went 8-2, but I actually don't remember. Okay, yeah. But I know that I lost my, my win and then, and... I guess that's that's how it goes, but that yeah. felt amazing. Yeah, just driving the rubber truck, driving the car, beep, getting beep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so can definitely recommend that deck. It's a ton of fun, especially if you like combat math and combat tricks and stuff like that. Uh, that actually brings me to uh, let's go to the question of Fire Ballard. Um, they're asking, you did a really deep run into Winter Tree Turn weekend and then won the challenge. Oh, that's for me. <laughs> I just <laughs> thought it was for just <laughs> deep run to Winter Tree Turn weekend and then won the challenge the next day. How much Winter do you usually play? Yeah, so I guess I mentioned that um, I play it like seriously like once a year when there's something happening. Uh, yeah, that's that's how much Winter I play. What do you think was the main factor to get such solid results? Um, it's because you're so good, right? Yeah, easy. Next question. No, <laughs> seriously. Um, it helped that I never played Bazaar decks because I I really don't know how the matchup goes, and it, it was always like pretty straightforward. I played those Xerox decks, I played Po, I played Doomsday, and I mean, there's only so much optimization you can do in those matchups. So I felt like I think it, the the main thing was prioritizing pressure versus disruption, which isn't always easy. But I felt I did a pretty decent job at that. I I played against that 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 Japanese Doomsday God you talked about like three times, and I won three times. But that's hey, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think I I got a pretty good understanding of sequencing, and I guess like you mentioned, right? That that's important for for workshop decks. Uh, yeah, and also like getting solid opening hands. I had insane opening hands with workshop. I money get quite a bit, but yeah, it's if you, if you go with those insane workshop opening hands, especially if you have like spheres and stuff, it's it's really broken. To yeah, <laughs> that that has just like been my impression of that. So these are the the takeaways. My one is uh, try and target the opponent twelve times with ancestral recall doesn't work, and yours is a land that taps for three mana is really broken. <laughs> <laughs> deep analysis that we do on every day <laughs> when it comes to gameplay how do you rate vintage compared to legacy i actually liked vintage more um without going too much into detail i do enjoy legacy um to a certain degree right now there i have issues with it but since you know everything got better for me once i saw that death and taxes is a good deck so i can always go go to that play style if, if i want to do that but overall, I actually like Vintage more, and that's more. That's really more about that. I really, really enjoyed Vintage. So, Legacy would need to do a lot of catching up to bring me to that state. But maybe you know, if I, if I play more Vintage, maybe I'd grow a little bit tired of it. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. for now, I really liked it. 
Mm-hmm. And then the last question, and I will defer that to Justin, actually. What deck would you recommend to someone willing to try the format online, considering it's so accessible? So let, let's assume that the person has like a decent legacy background, is, is aware of all the legacy decks and play styles. What would you, how would you introduce them to the format? Yeah, what I've been telling people who ask this question, because it's, it's a pretty common one, um, I, I think you should try to find a deck that is a play style you enjoy. And if you need to draw a parallel to a deck from another format, there's plenty of vintage players who will help you try to find your parallel. Um, someone brought up, oh, I like to play Rug Delver in Legacy. And so I recommend that they try either the Hollow Vine deck, which is a little bit of a weird one, and I'll explain that in a second, or, or the traditional Just Guy Xerox deck. The traditional Just Guy Xerox deck, just because you're going to leverage a lot of the same uh, play patterns and skill sets from from your your, your like good blue stuff legacy deck uh, by playing Just Guy Xerox. But Hollow Vine, because it, it, it actually plays out a little similar to something like Delver, where, where you're playing a Hollow one and then you're protecting it with counter spells, <laughs> free spells. You're almost playing a <laughs> Temple game style. And, and, and like there's like plenty of ways you can draw parallels. If you like playing Hogak in, in Legacy, well, we got a Hogak deck for you in Vintage. It's just even more powerful. So I, I think that the with the format being as balanced as it is, you should just try to find a deck that looks like it, it does a similar thing to what you enjoy doing in Magic, and, and there should be something there for you no matter what kind of deck you like to play. Makes perfect sense. I would just like to add, if you are just like starting out Vintage, I think what Justin said earlier about just rolling with the punches don't get frustrated when your opponent has their really strong draws you'll have yeah. the same if you play enough it's so important to be able to, to just take wins and move on especially in this format so yeah especially if you're new keep that in mind yeah i think that's a very healthy way to to approach playing a format in general um you sometimes you just take your losses and the sometimes the right move is to lose because consider it a ca- consider it a karma okay. thing for each time you get completely destroyed by some busted opening you get to do it to someone else and then you have the best fucking time of your life so yeah <laughs> it's it's put in get out yeah <laughs> okay okay we, we, we leave it at that <laughs> the final question is more like a meta question from tom the decker again he has a lot of awesome questions he says that Justin's catchphrase on the stream is "This game fucking sucks." <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> uh, well, I would go as far as a catchphrase. It has been said, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Tom is wondering how much you actually like play that up um, for everybody's entertainment, and how often you actually feel that way. This sounds like something you shouldn't admit to. I gotta say, I, I, I do put a little bit. <laughs> of value in, in, in the fact that a stream is an entertainment product so uh i wouldn't say that i'm always you know jumping up against the wall and banging my head on my door uh but as a hundred percent but but I, I don't also fake anything if i say this game fucking sucks something happened and i'm not happy about it <laughs> so yeah it, it's it's a mix it is streaming is entertainment but at the same time uh I want to win, and when I don't win, I'm sad and I'm angry, and I want <laughs> and I want to do better the next time, you know. <laughs> like your opponent keeps a seven, they have a turn one land. Oh, this game fucking sucks! So lucky, come on. <laughs> I th- I think the best the best example of that one. There's a really good clip of of God, I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's for it's for it's one of the creative clips for for exclamation mark MBT, uh, oh, <laughs> the, the command for mind break trap, and I'm playing against a. Uh, God, it must have been a Doomsday player. And I put like a big De- Mind's Desire on the stack. And I'm so hyped. I'm like, oh, yes, I finally done something cool. It's like, look, I look at all these Mind's Desires. <laughs> and, and, and an opponent just snaps it off the Mind Ray Trap. And oh. I, I lose it. And I'm up against the wall with my <laughs> hands on so my upsetting. head. And just like, oh, I just wanted to do the Mind's Desire thing. But you I, had to be like that. <laughs> I've got a similar story, actually, which is like, so... We used to run like small proxy vintage events in London in a pub, which was awesome. Nice. And I played just nonsense every single time. I played Surak Dragon Claw. I made a Triskai deck, a Phobia deck with punching <laughs> fires and stuff. It was just always nonsense. And one of the times, because I felt like when you're playing such busted like cards, especially fast mana, that you can do whatever you want, really. Yeah. And one of the times I played Tin Fins, and I had a Mind's Desire in there. And then I had like thought seized my opponent the turn before, and then I knew the coast was clear apart from one unknown. 
And yep. so I go for a Mice Desire for like 10. And I have Emrakul and Grizzly Brands in the deck as well. It should be good. And they're top decked uh, Ancestral Recall. So they recall themselves and then draw their one of Flusterstorm, which is just like so, <laughs> so grating. So they Flusterstorm all but two of them, which I can pay for. So I pay for two and I hit like a Mox and a, and a Dark Ritual. And I, flip, <laughs> and I flip the third card and it's Emrakul. It's just, oh. it's so upsetting. Oh, so, yeah. I, I do think that's the great part about Vintage, though. For <laughs> yeah. for every time that your opponent says no, you, you have a crazy time where you do something wild. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely a reoccurring thing that I like Completely. to do on stream is play uh, some off-the-cuff decks, like mm-hmm. uh, some of the famous ones. LSV played my Ninjas deck after I top-aided a, a challenge with it. But here's and, the difference. You don't just play uh, them. You, you fucking win challenges with these decks as well. So <laughs> True. <laughs> but yeah. for every time I win with ninjas, I go O2 with a Stormcaller Lurin. So, you know, people only see the wins. <laughs> I guess, I guess, yeah. But I think it's the, I think it's something worth with saying is that because you are playing all these powerful cards, you get to play Ancestral Recall. A deck mm-hmm. that has Ancestral Recall can have some bad cards in it and still win a lot of matches of Magic. So, yeah, yeah. by all means, like brew like find a deck you want to you want to try out there's cards you want to play just make sure you surround them with other broken cards to to offset the the brew you know <laughs> yep i completely agree oh crush of awesome. tentacles was another all-star that was my uh crush of te- i haven't cast a crush of yeah that's great that was a good one anyway so yeah i think that's that's gonna be it from us today justin thank you so so much for coming on this this was Honestly, I really, really enjoyed picking your brain about all the crazy things going on in Vintage, especially get, after getting a taste of it myself. So if you in the future want to hear us, like probably not on a regular basis talk about Vintage because we are still a dedicated legacy podcast, but every once in a while, so, so I'm keeping up with the Vintage players or something, if, we, if you want to do that, let us know in the Discord. And I, I'd love to have you on in the future again, Justin, if you, if you like. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. It was a ton of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Awesome. So where can people find you online? We already talked about your YouTube and your and your Twitch. Um, are you also on Twitter? Uh, yep. So my YouTube and Twitch, I'm actually level one, LVL1 at the end. Uh, my Twitter is G-E-N-N-A-I-R, Janair. Uh, it's more of a personal Twitter, but obviously I, I tweet tons and tons of stuff about Vintage. If you are interested in seeing other people's deck lists, I, my, one of my favorite things to do is after a challenge, find all the players who are tweeting out their top eight lists and, and retweeting them. Getting to see all the, the, the deck lists early is really fun. And then if you want to join the vintage streaming community, talk about vintage, learn vintage, I have a, a really big Discord. Um, I'll try to get you the link so that'll be in the uh, oh, yeah. in your description. In um, but that's where basically all the people who watch vintage streams gather to talk about decks and, and be salty about, <laughs> about <laughs> things that happened or, or show off really cool plays, um, learn a little bit here and there. Uh, it's a great place. So if you want to join that, we'll give you the link for that as well. I joined that place awesome. when he first made it, I think, or very, very new, and then just kind of put it into folders of things which like I just haven't been in for ages. Then I only went into it like a few weeks ago, and wow, it's amazing. There's so many people just talking nicely and just talking about <laughs> interesting things, and it's it's just constantly the activity is amazing. So that's yeah, highly recommended. That's, oh, it's just blown my mind how that has kind of blown up. It's actually probably the biggest place on the internet right now to talk about vintage i would oh, say it must be. i'm just um, looking at it now it's just like things for every you know, like deck, the new for every yeah <laughs> so <laughs> if you're interested in vintage interested in, in learning watching streamers that's the place to be awesome and if you want to learn more about us you can find us on at eternal mtg on twitter to follow our account you can always see what we're actually we're usually doing this this thing on social media right where everybody including our guests post that rings that they're having during this uh, the recording and you can guess and win recognition i guess <laughs> i think <laughs> i think i think i think we should need to try and think of a new thing soon let's uh yeah let's let's brew about it Let's yeah. prove it. We're gonna post our, our pictures of our socks, and you gotta. I'm, I'm wearing <laughs> oh Starbucks socks right now. Oh, that's... <laughs> I think you're always gonna have funny ones. Mine are just all plain black. Oh shit! I'm giving it away. Okay, we can't do that one now. You, you ruined the game. <laughs> uh... 
Cool. So yeah, that that that's it. Um, if you wanna if you wanna support what we're doing um, beyond you know just following us on social media, giving us shoutouts, letting your friends and enemies know about the podcast, you can also support us on patreoncom slash channel. You know, just like this week, our new Patreon, we got Luca Bodma who joined us, and of course, you know our long, long-standing tier um, Eternal Witness tier patrons, Valerio, Tommy Hinks, Trent Browers, Testicular, Moritz Vogel. And our Grizzle Brand top tier supporters, Big Top Ernst, Bajubat, Scott Monroe, Kurush Aliste, Jeremy Gates, Martin Nielsen, Eugene Freeman, and Henrik Kokutz. So once again, thanks a ton. If you if you want to support us and otherwise, you know, you can just like leave a review on iTunes. And as I learned a couple of weeks ago, you can't leave a review on Spotify. So <laughs> somebody actually contacted me and they were like, dude, Julian, how can I leave a review for you on Spotify? I really want to do it. And I was like, oh, actually, apparently you can't. I've been shouting that out every once in a while, but apparently it's not a thing. So Fake news. we are just stuck with letting our <laughs> friends and enemies know about it. So yeah, with that, um, guys, hope you're going to have a good time. Um, I'm going to head to bed. It's 20 minutes past two in the morning now. And oh. <laughs> Cool. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Good night. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh.